calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar is House File 2. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House File number 2, number 1 on the calendar for the day, an act relating to education finance, the first engrossment. <clears throat> there are amendments at the desk. If there's no objection, we will let the author explain the bill before we act on amendments. I recognize Representative Dabney. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and good afternoon, members. It's a, uh, it's a good day to pass a strong K-12 education finance bill to strengthen Minnesota schools, strengthen opportunity for Minnesota students, and support our school staff. I want to thank first by thanking our staff, <coughs> our nonpartisan staff, Annie Mock, Tim Strom, Christina Parra, and Emily Adrians. I'm grateful for the expertise and insights that they bring all of us every day, but especially their support for the education finance team through this negotiation process with the State Senate. And the partisan staff, without whom I don't know how I would operate. Sarah Burt, the committee administrator, Brittany Sunderland, our committee legislative assistant, and DFL caucus researchers, Mars Beltran de Irudquist. I also want to thank Laura Tickenholzey and Polly Cirkvenik for their key and consistent insights and support. And let me thank, or excuse me, let me welcome Andy Jorgensen to the education team. I also want to thank GOP caucus researcher Jody Winters for his service. You'll hear from the DFL conference committee members as well, but I was lucky to serve and share leadership with Chair Richardson. Representative Hassan, and Representative Pryor. And our committee always benefits from the GOP leadership of Representative Krisha. Members, since this bill, well, since House File 1065 left this floor in regular session, our principles have not changed. Every child in Minnesota deserves access to a world-class education. We need to keep students at the center of our deliberations. We know that we need to change the experience of and outcomes with and for our students, but most importantly, our black, indigenous, indigenous and students of color who we have historically underinvested in. That public funds are for public school students and to support our public schools. We know we can make great progress when we invest early, better supporting families and children in those critical years. We know that schools need stable, sufficient, and predictable funding, and that Minnesota students and school staff are deserving of our best, boldest, leadership that we can exercise. We left the House floor so many weeks ago with a bill providing $722 million in E-12 education funding. The Global Target Agreement on May 16th reduced that amount to a target of $525 million in the first biennium and $675 million in the second. To accommodate the solid investments you'll find in House File 2, the budget target was adjusted to spend $542 million in the first biennium, excuse me, $554 million in the first biennium and reduced to $669 million in the second. We'll come back, we came back with a large number of House provisions from negotiations. I'll note them be be below. We went into the conference committee process with a goal of stable and secure funding. Members, we did that. We have a 2.45% increase in the general education formula the first year of this coming biennium and a 2% increase the next. Now, members, I want to pause here for a moment because that stands in such sharp contrast with the Senate position. Recall that the Senate passed an education finance bill with a 0% increase 
in the general education formula the first year and a 0% increase in the general education formula the second. Imagine that. As our schools come out of pandemic and need to fully embrace the students wherever they're at, the State Senate promised them no additional resources to respond to those student needs. The bill you, you have the opportunity to vote on today is very different from the State Senate position. We also recognize that there are students who need additional services and that those services cost money and that we as a state fall short on investing in those students and those services. So this bill includes $10 million in one-time special education cross-subsidy payments. And for the first time in years, we invest in our English language learners across the state with an additional $8 million in funding over the next four years. We saw the obligation to improve the educational experience of students, particularly those students historically underserved in our schools. We've done that. Representative Hassan will speak in greater detail, but a historic investment in recruiting, training, and retaining teachers of color and American Indian teachers so that the folks at the front of the classroom look more like the students in our increasingly diverse classrooms across the state. $3 million included in that investment in the Sane Foundation. This was a uh, proposal of Representative Mariani. The Sane Foundation does great work in a number of districts. Uh, we're pleased to provide them support. Funding for Girls in Action, a key program championed by Represent Representative Igbaje, supporting girls of color in a number of districts. And, you know, yesterday, Representative Heinzman observed that math is hard, and it can be. So we provide additional funding for math core, for targeted tutoring for students who need that extra attention to make sure that math may be hard, but they can learn that they can do it. Representative Richardson championed consistently through this process non-exclusionary discipline practices and training for teachers so that students can stay in school, so students can continue to learn. We've got support for teachers and school staff to learn new skills. Representative Edelson has been a great and consistent champion for the science of reading to give more students the opportunity to learn that critical skill as early as possible in their school careers. And we've come back with $3 million to support teachers being trained in the letters program. And Representative Feist, realizing the moment and the critical nature, championed funding for suicide prevention training for teachers. They can be that first line of concern and contact and with life-saving skills can make that key difference. We also recognized that the most impact and the best return for state resources is when we invest early and provide opportunities for all families and children. Representative Pryor will speak more to this, but we fought and fought and fought to preserve 4,000 opportunities for little kids to attend preschool in districts across the state, and we're bringing that back. That's critical. And Representative Fredrickson had championed informal learning in our state's children's museums. We added state support for three additional children's museums in Mankato, Grand Rapids, and Bloomington, and assured that that state investment goes to making those museums those wonderful places for small children to learn, even while they're playing, are available to all Minnesota families. In addition, members, we support the four state agencies that our uh, committee has oversight over. We increased the operating funds for the Minnesota Department of Education, 4.9 million in fiscal years 21 and 23, accounting for a holdback of 3.25 million 
in fiscal year 21 and an additional $2.9 million in fiscal years 24 and 25. The Professional Educators Licensing and Standards Board gets an additional $193 million for their work in the first biennium and $240,000 in the second, while the Minnesota State Academy's representative Daniels see an increase in their operating funds of $778,000 in the first biennium and $1,032,000 in the second. And lastly, the Perpich Center for Arts Education that provides unique opportunities for high school juniors and seniors from across the state and important professional development in the arts for teachers everywhere, an additional $351,000 in the first biennium and $466,000 in the next. Madam Speaker, I hope to hear now from Representative, Representatives Hassan and Pryor on the parts of the bill that they have expertise over. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Hassan. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker. Uh, can you guys hear me fine? Yes, Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. It's with a great privilege to rise today in support of House File 2, our education, uh, E12, E12 education omnibus bill. I first want to thank Chair Daphne for his commitment to ensure all Minnesota students can have a positive learning experience and outcomes. I would also like to thank my friend, um, Chair Richardson, for her dedication to equity and inclusion for all of our students, and Representative um, Laurie Pryor for her tireless efforts to help us understand early childhood uh, education and its importance. Last but not least, I want to thank our nonpartisan and partisan staff, who without them, I don't think we could have accomplished anything. I'm grateful for your knowledge and wisdom. All Minnesota students deserve a world-class education, no matter where they live, what they look like, or what their learning abilities are, which is why we fought a strong per pupil uh, investment in education, uh, 2.4, 5, and 2% increase in the general education formula over the next two years which is the largest uh, investment in 15 years and will help our students and retain, our, our schools retain teachers and keep our classes from growing. You might hear many arguments about what might or might not be, bill in, be in this bill today. However, I'll tell you that this bill is a historic investment in education. It's a compromise uh, agreement between a divided government and it's a great bill to be proud of. While this is not a perfect bill, nor does it contain everything we wanted, nonetheless, it has many great provisions to address the education loss of COVID-19, as well as equity provisions that I'm extremely proud of. It's no secret that Minnesota leads the nation in the opportunity gap. Our PIPAC students were falling behind prior to COVID, and I can only imagine how COVID has exacerbated this inequity. It's our responsibility as state leaders to address this inequity and provide all the tools necessary for our PIPAC students to succeed. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting change. This is why I'm glad to say that this bill is different and would make a positive impact in our students' learning experience. The professions that are uh, in this bill, some of them are near and dear to my heart. Uh, the increasing teachers of color and American Indian teachers professions are significant funding to address Minnesota's shortage uh, of teachers of color, while students of color and Native American students make up about 35% of Minnesota's K-12 student population. Only 5.6% of teachers uh, are from teachers of color and American Indian teachers. While the agreement does not fully uh, fund the request um, from House file, 217, it makes a historic investment in addressing um, <clears throat> the opportunity gap. We're spending $5 million on um, a year for the Grow Your Own program, $3 million and one-time funding for the Sané Foundation, $2.5 million for teacher mentorship programs aimed at increasing teacher retention, $750,000 um, one-time funding for Black men teach, um, which is a really unique program. Um, and I was very um, honored to hear um, how you know, unique this program is. As we know that uh, many of I, our young male uh, black students um, struggle finding 
good mentors and people that look like them that they can have as role models. So increasing t uh, black men t uh, black men teachers in our education is a good investment and would have a positive impact. Two hundred fifty thousand a year for teacher recruitment marketing campaign. Two hundred thousand uh, per year for hiring bonuses to recruit to recruit teachers of color from outside of Minnesota. Hundred fifty thousand per year for American Indian uh, teacher preparation uh, grants, and one hundred twenty-five thousand per year for um, introduction to teaching concurrent enrollment courses in high school. The downside about compromises is that you give up something to get something. While this is a huge investment in the efforts of increasing teachers of color and American Indian teachers, we still had to give up some of the provisions during our no negotiations. As the vice chair of education policy, I'm a little sad that our Senate counterparts would not agree to some of our great uh, policy provisions. Uh, the main areas where we were able to find agreement were preventing uh, school meal shaming, delaying implementation of the new fiscal education and arts standards to allow schools to focus on addressing the impact of pandemic on student learning this fall and special education recovery. We also reached an agreement on smaller provisions um, such as requiring school boards to for provide annual notice to parents of, of district policy relating to absence uh, because of religious uh, observance. School, um, sorry, but uh, requiring school districts to develop a teacher mentoring program and allowing them to use staff development revenues. Um, requiring school districts and charter schools to create seizure action plan for students with, who are diagnosed uh, seizure disorders. Requiring schools to notify students and parents on environmental hazard as soon as practical, once notified by MDA and PCA. It would be unfair. It would be unfair for me uh, as a chair uh, not to uh, mention some of the work that uh, some of the provisions that didn't make it, um, especially uh, the non exclusionary uh, discipline and preventing suspension and expulsion of students through grade three. As we know, discipline practice impacts BIPAC students disproportionately, and this widens the opportunity gap. Black students are eight times more likely to be suspended or expelled, while Indigenous students are 10 times more likely be suspended or expelled compared to their white counterpart peers. Our students must be in our classrooms. Our students must be in our classrooms in order for them to learn. Uh, Chair Richardson has worked really hard um, last year on passing the pre-K suspension uh, ban. And she wanted to expand that work this year uh, by trying to expand that to K through uh, third grade which would have made a huge difference for our PIPAC students and their families. Sadly, this one did not make it to the final cut. Uh, what also didn't make it to the final cut is prohibiting the use of uh, restrictive procedures on children under the age of five, creating procedures that would allow school districts uh, to better retain teachers of color during layoff, requiring strong uh, social emotional learning curriculum, requiring ethnic, ethnic studies, Requiring ethnic studies and all academic uh, standards and allowing students uh, to carry traditional tobacco, um, our indigenous students to carry traditional tobacco. With many, with many great provisions missing, it's still a fantastic bill and a bill to be proud of. This bill is about creating and fostering positive experience and impact for all of our students. And I'm proud to fight for our students and I invite you to join us. Thank you. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Pryor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I um, request, can you hear me okay? Yes, Representative Pryor. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to speak about uh, some of the provisions related to the early childhood aspects of the bill. And I want Members, to start- please take your conversations to the alcove. Thank you. And I want to start by just noting, um, I think we heard an early child's voice in the last presentation. And if you're like me, um, you just smile. And I, I do have to say that this is one of the areas where I think we find uh, much agreement in the importance of early childhood and in supporting those years um, as a body. Um, and uh, very grateful 
um, for the, the opportunity I had this year to be on the Early Childhood Committee. And I, I do wanna say that this was very much a bipartisan committee. It was collegial, ideas from um, both parties were entertained. Um, we had great conversations, great discussions. And I do wanna thank uh, uh, lead uh, Mary Franson uh, for her contributions to this committee and to um, the committee members, uh, uh, Republican committee members. And I also wanna thank Chair Pinto. I, I don't think that we would have an early childhood committee without the, the drive and the determination and uh, the advocacy that Chair Pinto has brought um, to this house. So uh, thank you early childhood committees uh, to our partisan and nonpartisan staff. Uh, probably the, the area of this bill that uh, is, has the biggest impact on early childhood as has been discussed before is, is the uh, is the preservation of our voluntary pre-K slots. And I can just say that these, these, uh, these uh, seats, uh, these students are in schools all across the state. And I'm just gonna throw out some of the cities where we, we have VPK, voluntary pre-K. Pre uh, we have it in Owatonna, St. Cloud, Austin, Crookston, Robbinsdale, Worthington, Brainerd, Sleepy Eye. And that's just a few of them. And we also have them in the Hopkins School District. And we have one of the elementary schools in my district, which is Gatewood Elementary. Now, what's happening in these VPK um, slots in these classrooms with these students is they're learning how to do school. And this is such important preparation. They're learning to do higher level skills, such as um, using an inside voice. Um, they're learning the mechanics of how to line up and walk down a hall together without pushing and shoving. They're learning how to share the attention of the adult in the room and also how to listen to that adult, the teacher, and follow the directions that are being given. They're also learning something so important to their, uh, their education. They're learning how to focus, even when there's other students around, not to be distracted, but to focus and get their own work done and to be their own problem solver. These are important skills. And what, we've, what we heard in committee and again in the conference committee, we know that these VP, VPK slots, um, they are helping students and they are making a difference. The superintendent of one of the school districts that has these um, VPK um, programs, she, she told us that they now have the data that says um, that these advantages and these skills that the students are learning in these early years, are they are able to maintain even as they work through and in the first, second and third grade. And as we know in education, um, third grade, that's really, that's a pivotal year. Um, you need to learn by the time you hit the third grade. And these kids that have these opportunities that have this quality education, they are ready to learn to read um, when, they're, when they're entering the third grade. So when we talk about these opportunity gaps, this is um, one of the most crucial opportunities that we can give our students. And so in this bill, we do maintain these VPK slots. Um, we do not, we're not able to get it as a permanent change, but at least for these next two years and for those four-year-olds, um, they will have these opportunities and they will not be lost. And for that, I, I am grateful and, and glad to see um, that, uh, that it is part of the bill and it was not part of the Senate bill, but it is the House position and it was a House position that we were able to maintain. So um, I will close by uh, thanking my fellow conferees um, and to thank uh, Chair Dabney, uh, Chair Richardson, uh, Chair Hassan, uh, Representative Hassan uh, for the, the, uh, the work that you did on this committee. It was, it was a very thoughtful um, and uh, very much a, a good exchange of ideas uh, that brought us to the point that we are right now um, under some difficult negotiations, but um, that's the nature of what we do. So um, thank you members uh, for this presentation and, and uh, the opportunity to talk about uh, early childhood and in our K through to E through 12 setting. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the member from Mille Lacs, Representative Erickson. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I would like to propose a motion. So I move that we refer House File 2 to the Committee on Education Policy uh, and ask for a roll call. Roll call is requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be roll call. Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, it's been a long time policy in this uh, chamber and in the House of Representatives that when policy changes occur in the omnibus bill, the bill is referred to, automatically referred, in fact, to the policy committee for discussions. And because we have some Senate proposals that we never heard in the policy committee, like uh, the digital well-being, uh, we're not all that familiar with letters, the, the learning essentials for teachers uh, for reading and spelling, you know, we should have a more robust discussion on that. Uh, we also have changes in the special education policy that came from the Senate. And for that reason, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I would ask that we refer this to education, the Committee on Education Policy. Thank you. Discussion? Representative Dabney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I rise uh, in opposition to the Erickson Amendment. The digital well-being uh, provision that she highlighted was one of Representative Morrison's, one that she remained in contact with me throughout uh, the negotiations of this uh, agreement. Uh, the changes in uh, the, the limited number of changes in other policy areas were uh, available to members of the Education Finance Committee. Uh, when we heard the bill, I believe it was on Wednesday of this last week. No questions were raised at that time, although members were given full opportunity to ask any questions that they so chose. Uh, so members, uh, I would ask that we vote no on the Erickson Amendment, continue the debate on this bill. Let's pass a good, strong bill for our K-12 education today. Thank you. Further discussion? Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, to the Erickson motion, I vote that we, uh, or I, I ask for you to vote in support of that. Members, uh, we did have limited discussion on the Ed Finance because we were waiting for public testimony. There was none. And we were making room for anything that would allow for that public testimony. We haven't had that. Now, we know what's going to happen. We, we know how this is going to play out. Um, the bill will get heard. It'll get passed. But we do have to talk about the fact that there was not ample opportunity to do what we're supposed to do in the legislature. And, you know, whether we agree or disagree, those agreements and disagreements make for better policy, they make for better bills, they make for better decisions. And I understand that it, um, both sides have done this, I understand there's opportunities when you're the only one in the room and you get to make decisions without having to go through all that icky stuff of back and forth, but that isn't what we're supposed to do. And what Representative Erickson is calling out, rightly so, is we should have had that discussion. We should have at least afforded that opportunity. And shortcuts and short circuits do not make for better policy. In fact, they make for worse policy. Um, so support the Representative Erickson motion. Uh, this should have gone through policy. Uh, Representative Richardson, who has great ideas, I've heard her come up with lots of wonderful things. I believe the opportunity was lost not to have those done in a public forum and to bring public testimony in. Further discussion? See no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the motion. Those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk Call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet. <clears throat> uh, 
<coughs> Bonner. Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, Bonner no. no. Baker. Baker. Right. Baker, I. Berg. Berg, no. Berg, no. Bernardi. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. Bierman. Bierman, no. Bliss. <clears throat> Bliss. Bo. Bo votes aye. Bo aye. Christensen. Christensen. Christensen, no. Christensen, no. Edelson. Edelson, no. Edelson, no. Hamilton. Hamilton votes aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Heinzman. Heinzman, yes. Heinzman, aye. Keeler. Keeler, no. Keeler, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Kosnick. Kosnick, aye. Kosnick, aye. Lily. Lily, no. Lily, no. Mariani. Mariani. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. McDonald. McDonald. Miller. Miller, I. Miller, I. Morrison. Morrison, no. Morrison, no. Nelson, N. Nelson and I. Nelson and I. Novotny. Novotny, I. Novotny, I. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, I. O'Driscoll, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? No. Please state that again. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail. I recognize the member from Stearns, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I move that House File 2 be re-referred to the Committee on Early Childhood Finance and Policy. Uh, Representative Damoth moves to uh, re-refer the bill to Early Childhood Finance Committee. And I would request a roll call. There Seeing 50 hands, there will be roll call. Representative David. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the Early Childhood Finance and Policy has done great work this session. We have heard much testimony, and we have a lot of provisions that are very important. We had the opportunity this morning at 8.30 to have a walkthrough of these provisions that we're hearing today. But yet in this bill, I feel that it is light on early learning scholarships and the early learning provisions overall. So with that, members, I would request a green vote to re-refer this, this bill. Further discussion? Madam Speaker. Representative Prisha. Okay. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Damon, thanks for, uh, uh, for raising the point I, that I would agree with you that I'm certainly disappointed in some of the early learning items being um, absent from this bill. I know that it is not at all due to a lack of effort on the part of our House conferees, which 
uh, they pushed extremely hard. Um, I will note, as you said, that we had a walk through the bill this morning. Uh, there were no questions at that time from members, uh, and I think we provided a fair amount of time to ask those questions. Um, and at this point, I'll just point out to members that uh, the early learning provisions that are in this bill are those that passed through our committee. Again, there's many that, that did not make it through, but not for lack of effort. Members, I would urge a no vote on this motion. Thank you. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and Chair Pinto, uh, thank you for your comments. You did have a committee that, hearing this morning. It was informational. And um, I understand you're checking boxes off for discussion, right? I uh, checked this box off. I checked this box off. But I hope that outside the theatrics of what happens on the House floor today, I hope that the members from the other side who we've had in-depth conversations with about policy, and I know Chair Pinto uh, we've had conversations, other members, we've had serious conversations about how we fix some of these egregious things that our children are facing. And I hope that while you check the box and defend what you did on the House floor today, that when you walk off this House floor that you really say, you know what, that wasn't the right process. I hope that going forward we're not setting precedent into cement, then in fact we're looking at what we're doing saying this isn't the right way to do it. I understand you're going to defend it. I understand you're going to check the box. But I hope in your heart, because I think if the roles were reversed, you would find out this isn't the best way to get to policy. Fixing these achievement gaps and getting to our youth is far too important to just say you checked a box. So members, support Representative Damus' motion to re-refer. Not because we're just doing and checking boxes here, but because it is the right thing to go back and debate the truth. The one thing that I've learned is the truth can handle hard conversations, even if we're afraid as human beings to have those disagreements. Let's not be afraid of disagreements. Let's be more afraid of the fact that if we don't get it right, we're going to have egregious consequences for students who are counting on us to get it right. So I ask that you vote green on the Representative Damoth motion. Further discussion. See no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Those that are voting remotely, please vote. <laughs> Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. Baker. Baker, I. Baker, I. <laughs> Berg. Berg. Berg, no. Berg, no. Bernardi. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. Bliss. Bliss, I. Bliss, I. Bo. Bo, I. Bo, I. Draskowski. Draskowski, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Heinzman. Heinzman. Kosnick. Kosnick, aye. Kosnick, aye. Lee. Lee. Lily. Lily, no. Lily, no. Mason. 
Mason, no. Mason, no. <clears throat> McDonald. <clears throat> McDonald. Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Murphy. Murphy, no. Murphy, no. Nelson, N. Nelson, N. Novotny. Novotny, aye. Novotny, aye. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, aye. O'Driscoll, aye. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 56, 56 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail. I recognize the member from Morrison, Representative Cresha. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would like to make a motion to re-refer House File 2 to the Education Finance. Representative Quisha moves to re-refer House File 2 to Education Finance. Representative Quisha. And to speak to my motion, uh, members, um, I'm not going to make a roll call on this. Uh, I'm not going to even push it. Uh, but I am going to make a couple comments. What my motion really should be is a motion to not accept the conference committee report so that we could debate that. But we didn't have conference committees. This did not follow the, the process. Members, I would f normally, what I should do as well is follow this up with a motion to take it to taxes because that would be the right path. Members, we're not following any of those processes. And yes, you're hearing it over and over, but you know what I haven't heard from the other side? What I have yet to hear from the majority is this is the process but we can do better next time. I have yet to hear anybody over on that side say, you know what, we're here, we have a limited amount of time, but we're going to do better. I haven't heard that yet. Why? Because it appears the process is working for the majority. By locking out public testimony, by reducing this to a small amount of people that are talking about it, things are doing exactly what they shouldn't do in the legislature, and that is they're moving quickly. One of the things that I have learned is this place is not designed to pass bills. Why? Because passing bills affects people's lives, and in turn, we have to get it right. Members, we've, the House leadership here missed the deadlines in May, put us in a position where we're boxed in, and now we're shoving wet noodles through holes, hoping they're gonna come out the other side. And so with that, Madam Speaker, I'm going to withdraw my motion we're going to talk about this heavily, but someone somewhere needs to acknowledge we can do better. We have to do that. Representative Quisha withdraws his motion to re refer to, uh, House File 2 to the Education Finance Committee. There are amendments at the desk. Representative Lucero offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the, <clears throat> the amendment. Well, Lucero moves to amend House File Number 2, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A-22. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Lucero, who will, who will explain you, the Speaker. amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This is an amendment that we voted on when we sent the K-12 omnibus bill off the floor the first round. And we successfully adopted this amendment. Unfortunately, it came back. Uh, without the language in there. So I'm seeking to offer this amendment, which this body has already voted in favor of. And just to remind members what this uh, language does, it's a digital or online library database resource related bill. And it would prohibit and prevent K through 12 children using a digital or online library database resources from sending, receiving, viewing, or downloading materials that are deemed to be harmful to minors by requiring a filter or blocking access to obscene materials, materials harmful to minors, and materials that depict the sexual exploitation of a minor. And there are cross-references to those definitions that are already in Minnesota statute. So members, we've already voted in favor of this. 
I'm hoping we can do it again because there's, there is and should be no opposition to this verbiage to protect the, the minds of our children. And uh, Madam Speaker, I would ask for a roll call. Seeing 50 hands, there will be roll call. Further discussion? The member from Hennepin, Representative Daphne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and Representative Lucero, I share your disappointment that the Senate was unwilling to accept this House position. I want to assure members on the other side that the conference committee and the working group fought for every House position. I thought this one was going to be easy. It was overwhelmingly supported by the House when Representative Lucero offered this as, as an amendment to House File 1065. It's completely redundant on federal law. Schools and libraries already fully com comply with this, so it's, it's just unnecessary verbiage in state statute. But what politician doesn't like unnecessary verbiage in state statute? It was offered by a Republican. A Republican Senate should want to accept it. And they wouldn't. I don't know if Senator Anderson, Representative Lucero, failed to advocate for it. I don't know. They, wouldn't, they would never explain their opposition. But members, we have an agreement. It's important that we move this agreement forward today. So I ask for a no vote on the Lucero Amendment. Thank you. Further discussion? See no further discussion. Is a member Final wishing remarks? to speak? Yes, Lucero. Oh, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, uh, every time we hear, uh, as we just did, and if we continue to hear it for the remainder of the day, that we have a global agreement and therefore we need to vote no, we just need only remember yesterday's vote when that uh, was apparently broken with the amendment uh, to the bill yesterday. So it doesn't matter if there's a global agreement, if it's good policy and something that the this body, the House of Representatives, stands up for and agrees with, we should uh, ignore any statements citing any global agreement, and we need to vote green. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk would take the roll. Those that are voting rem remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. Baker. Baker, I. Baker, I. Berg. Berg, no. Berg, no. Bernardi. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. Bliss. Bliss. Bo. Bo votes I. Bo, I. Hamilton. Hamilton votes aye. Hamilton aye. Houseman. Houseman no. Houseman no. Heinzman. Heinzman yes. Heinzman aye. Kosnick. Kosnick aye. Kosnick aye. Lily. Lily no. Lily no. McDonald. McDonald aye. McDonald I. Miller. Miller. Nelson N. Nelson N. I. I. Nelson N. I. Novotny. Miller I. I. Miller I. Novotny. Miller. 
Novotny. Novotny, aye. Novotny, aye. Sandstead. Uh, Sandstead, no. Sandstead, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? Bliss, aye. Bliss, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Representative Gruenhinger offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Gruenhinger moves to amend House on number two, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A16. I recognize the member from Sibley, Representative Gruenhinger. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Yeah, this is a educational choice bill. And uh, I'll just give a, as we know, uh, Senator Chamberlain had a very strong educational choice bill, which unfortunately did not make it into the uh, final agreement. But uh, this actually is a little bit stronger, and I'll explain the amendment. It establishes an opportunity scholarship program to provide students in the Minneapolis and St. Paul school districts an opportunity to use general education funding to comply the, with the state's compulsory instruction law with non-public education. Any kindergarten, kindergartner through 12th grade residing and enrolling in either the Minneapolis or St. Paul schools districts are eligible for an opportunity scholarship. Students participating in the opportunity scholarship program will be counted as enrolled in their resident public school direct for purposes of generating average daily membership, which will be used to cover the expenses of the scholarship. So members, this does not raise taxes. It just shifts the funding uh, to an opportunity scholarship program that uh, allows the parents to control it for the child's education. Parents may use the opportunity scholarship funds for the following. Tuition, including non-public school, after-school enrichment, academic summer schools, music lessons, and tutoring. Textbooks include instructional materials and supplies, musical instrument rental and purchase, and computer hardware and educational software. Transportation paid to others for transporting children to the school. The scholarship will be equal to the average general education revenue per pupil. That amounts to, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul School District, about ten dollars to $12,000 per pupil. Will be shifted to an or a, uh, opportunity scholarship controlled by the parents. Districts will have a process for participating families to submit receipts for eligible expenses, including for tuition, which may be billed on a monthly basis. The student family may request any funds remaining in the student's opportunity scholarship at the end of the year to be deposited into a 529 savings plan. If funds not deposited into the 529 plan, the funds must be deposited into a Minnesota College Savings Plan. Members, think about this. So once we shift the money to the parents and, and follow the student, if they don't spend all that money in a year, the balance gets to go into a college or uh, educational savings plan for future after graduation education. Members, we all know the albatross of student debt in college or continuing education. Do you understand the amount of money if they just saved, if they didn't spend $2,000 of that uh, 10 to 12,000 per year, and you put that away for 12 years into a 529 savings plan or invested in the market, they would probably have between 100 and 200 thousand dollars when they graduated that they could use to further their education. And instead of graduating four years from now with 100 or 150 thousand or 50 thousand of debt, they could be debt free. And what I'd really like to add to this bill, which I didn't. 
that at the end of their education, whatever money was left in that savings plan could be used for a down payment on their first house. Think of that, members. Rather than graduating with huge uh, college debt and educational debt, they're actually in a position to pay for their college education and put a down payment if they're frugal. Now again, they can't buy a uh, Corvette sports car. I wouldn't put that in there. But they could actually put a down payment on their first house. Uh, I think that's a far better scenario than what we currently have, members, where, pe where students struggle to pay, repay the debt, almost a trillion dollars, over a trillion in our country, and on top of that, many students don't pay the debt at all. Okay, uh, members, I developed, an, I believe competition can solve the achievement gap. And that's what this amendment's about. Competition will solve what billions of dollars will not solve. And we know in Minnesota that we have one of the worst achievement gaps between minorities and uh, Caucasian students in the United States. Um, members, just for a little history lesson on what we've spent, and this happened to be a front page article from the Star Tribune in 2019. According to the article in the Star Tribune, and I appreciate they did an article on this, that particular year we spent $600 million to address the achievement gap. And the five years before, we spent more than $5 billion to address the achievement gap. Members, what we've done, we simply rearranged the deck shares rather than introducing competition. And I'd be, you know, I don't think just piling more and more money onto the system is going to produce better results. We need competition. And, and members, some of you are probably saying, well, we can't have tax dollars go to, uh, religious schools or parochial schools. Well, members, when I got in the Marine Corps, I got the GI Bill. That was federal tax dollars. I could cash that in at a secular college, a Baptist college, a Methodist college, or a Catholic college. It didn't matter. So we have legal precedent for allowing students the money to follow the students to the, to the education of their choice. The other thing, members, I became uh, very interested in this, just a minute, when I did jail ministry for 13 years. You know, people are still responsible for their actions, but I used to go around and read in jail ministry with the prisoners, and I was surprised how many of them couldn't read or would pass or could barely read, members. So again, people are responsible for their actions, but th not being able to read to grade level is a contributing factor to economic uh, loss of opportunity, and hence poverty. Uh, members, I attended a rally at the governor's uh, office, or at the governor's uh, home for school choice. It was put on by Exodus. Exodus, as I understand it, is headed up by five black ladies. And they were, therefore, they were supporting Senator Chamberlain's bill at the time. It's interesting, members, one of the people that spoke at the, uh, at the rally, which I was really appreciative of, was a former leader of Black Lives Matter. He left the movement because here's his quote. He learned they had little concern for rebuilding the black family and instead has supported the movement for educational choice. Members, please think of the opportunity that we have to change the paradigm. During that rally, by the way, 
it was shared that four out of five uh, uh, students in Minneapolis St. Paul cannot read to grade level. Members, that's about 80 percent. That's what we're funding. And all we want to do is reorganize re, 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 uh, the deck shares and pile more money onto it. That is terrible. We need to give these children a chance. Competition will produce what billions of dollars won't produce, members. And if I want a strong public school system. I, well, as you, as you know, I served 16 years on the public school. I wanted to do the best I could. But that school needs equal competition. And parents can, will give you that. Uh, think of this, members, and we need a federal waiver, but think of the special ed situation where they could take that money into an opportunity scholarship and actually hire tutors to help their child with specific needs that cannot be addressed in a larger setting. It would be a boon to retired teachers and you'd, you'd eliminate a lot of the controversy, and I've been involved with it when I was on the school board, yeah, of course, Dean's always trying to help me. Um, you know, for uh, 16 years, I could tell you some horror stories of parents wanting certain serv services, and I got involved with the meeting, and yet the school district and the special ed director was resisting it. And ultimately, you sat and paid lawyers $250 an hour, I think, or more, to try to resolve it. I've been through arbitration and all that stuff. Anyway, members, the, uh, I did want to give a compliment to your bill, Chair Daphne. My understanding, you referred to it as a letters program, and that letters program, based on my understanding, promotes uh, the teaching of, of instructs teachers on how to teach intensive systematic phonics, uh, 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 spelling, traditional spelling, and also grammar. Members, one of the things I learned when I was on the school board is that much of the reading curriculum that we promote in the, pu in the public school doesn't work very well. I was told that even by teachers, okay? And my uh, principal in elementary told me there's only three ways to teach reading, okay? She said there's intensive systematic phonics, then there's basal literature, which is basically whole language with phonics sprinkled in to try to fool the public that phonics is actually being taught, and the third way is pure whole language, which is memorization of the word. Members, if you want to le learn Chinese, you use whole language, because it's a picture-based language. We're a sound syllable-based language, and I've had debates with do uh, PhDs of reading on this. And let me just challenge you to do this. Go inside your dictionary and look at a word that you don't know how to pronounce. If you don't know how to pronounce that word, what do you do? You look to the right, and what do you see? You see the phonetic breakdown of that word. If you haven't had learned the rules of phonics, you don't have a chance in the wor world of pronouncing that word accurately. Members, and yet we're teaching this whole language, this inventive spelling and creative writing, which is all based on psycholinguistic theory not on what actually works. It causes reading problems, which can lead to the labeling and drugging of your child in the classroom. Because when they can't read, it's hard for them to participate. Uh, members, um, you know, we need a reading program, and I again appreciate the letters program, that helps new immigrants and existing low immigrants or low income people to learn how to read. It's one way they can advance themselves economically 
and we want them to become a part of the middle class. That's what we want. But members, that's hard to do when we've got one of the worst achievement gaps in the nation. And instead of introducing competition, we simply pile more money onto the system. Please, members, help us teach these children to read. Uh, you know, the other thing I'll say is this. The, um, you know, one of the uh, dark stains on our history is slavery, okay? Do you know what it was illegal to do with slaves in the South? To teach them to read. It was illegal, members. Because not being able to read traps them in dependency. We need, you know, when you look at what we're doing with the achievement gap, we're not far from that. So members, if you care about those children, which I know you do, if you care about minorities and giving them a better opportunity, please vote green on this amendment. Hist One day when you're gone from here, you'll be glad you did. And give those parents and children an opportunity to improve their lives and not be trapped in a failing school. And by the way, competition will, will improve the failing school. Madam Speaker, I ask for a roll call. In 15, seeing 15 hands, there will be roll call. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, oh, well, I have more to say later. But uh, if Chair Daphne would yield for a question. He will yield. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Daphne. Chair Daphne, again, I appreciate some aspects of your bill. I just mentioned letters. But can't you see the benefit of school choice being introduced into the omnibus, omnibus bill? Representative Daphne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. I appreciate your introduction to the amendment. I hadn't realized that you'd spent 13 years in jail ministry and 16 years on a school board. So thank you for bringing the body up, up to speed. Uh, we have a very vigorous school choice system in Minnesota. In fact, one of the leading school choice systems in the country. We, of course, are the place that uh, created the first charter schools. We have open enrollment where children can leave the district they live in and go to a neighboring district or, or in another district. We have online learning options. We have uh, post-secondary enrollment options of several kinds. Uh, students can go to a college campus. They can receive college instruction uh, on their, in, within their school building. We have a, a very vigorous nation-leading public school choice system and we have the largest, what largest achievement gap and opportunity gap in the country. So you can draw your own conclusion, but we've got the most, well, amongst the most vigorous school choice systems and the largest achievement and opportunity gap. So I fail to see where a private school voucher system changes that. I think what we need to do is invest in the students that you claim to care about. Let's do that. Let's invest in all of them, their families and communities. Thank you. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Chair Daphne. Chair Daphne, I don't doubt that every member here, whether on the internet or on the floor, cares about education of our young people. I have no doubt about that. It's just if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, don't expect different results. And that's what we're doing with the achievement gap. We just rearrange the deck chairs, pile millions of billions of dollars onto the system, and think we're going to get different results. Members, you're not going to. We need competition. We need parents to control. And we'll have better public schools, which I want to succeed. They'll be stronger, and you're going to have better results 
as far as the academics with your students. That's the solution. Will it solve every problem? No, but it'll be a big step in the right direction. Again, members, what they don't spend each year, they can stick in a savings account. They can, for 12 years, if they didn't spend $2,000 a year, stick it into your calculator and just got the average market return. They're gonna have between 100 and 200,000 or more in education. And if they go to a trade school, they could probably almost pay cash for their first house afterwards. Although that's not in the bill, but I'd like to see it in there. Rather than the system we have now, where, we're where we have the largest achievement gap, they're graduating. If they go on to college, they got huge debt, the majority of them afterwards, and that's an albatross on their future. I just want you to think about it. Don't feel about it, okay? Remember, reason is the life of law, not feelings, all right? I know, uh, you know, that it's a difficult decision for you members, but I've made difficult decisions in my life plenty of times. And, uh, and members, I do have to share this. There are those that call trapping these minority children in failed public schools year after year after year educational racism, all right? Give them a chance. Give them a chance to improve themselves academically. You will be amazed at the reduction of problems that happen in the school district. And I could share several stories of parents who wanted to leave the school district, and part of the time it was probably their fault, and part of the time it was the school district's fault. But who's gonna sort that all out? If they had the money and they didn't, they would choose a different school. And maybe if it was their fault, they'd go from one school to the next and finally figure out, you know what? It's me and my child that needs to change, not the system. And I've had teachers crying at the table over this stuff. And those of you who've been involved know how bitter, resentful, and the accusations that fly across the table on some of these meetings. Give the parent a chance to leave. And a lot of these parents can't afford to leave. This scholarship allows them to do that. Members, um, I don't know. <laughs> I spent a lot of my life trying to help people floating down the river of life, wounded and hurting on a voluntary basis. And I'm not a, I'm, you know, I'm a slow learner, but I got a long memory, <laughs> okay? And I remember uh, some of their situations. And members, this is a vote to care about these children, to really address a solution to the achievement gap, to raise them up and give them an opportunity to be part of the middle class, which is what I want. I want the immigrants. I don't care what their ethnic background is. When they come here, just like my parents, they wanted a chance. Locking them into a failed school is not the way to go regardless of how much money you spend. Okay, I think you got my point. But anyway, um, with that, uh, members, please think and vote green on this amendment. The member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Actually, I did lower my hand because uh, I forgot what I was going to say because Representative Grunhagen uh, spoke a long time. But since you called my name, I do want to just support Representative Grunhagen's uh, amendment. Uh, it's uh, members, as you know, Representative Grunhagen is uh, so passionate about this issue, as, as many are. But he has such great expertise and knowledge of the system. And I just rise uh, to support his amendment and encourage you to support it. I have a feeling uh, I know how it's going to go, but I encourage you to vote green for the children and for uh, Representative Grunhagen's amendment. Uh, thank you, Representative Grunhagen, for this excellent amendment and your great wisdom and knowledge in uh, your words today. Thank you. It, for me personally, uh, very inspirational, and I think it is to many of our members on both sides of the aisles. I listen to your words carefully. You are very uh, wise in the words you choose and considerate and compassionate and knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you for being a fighter for our schools for our children. God bless. Thank you very much. Listen. 
Madam Speaker. The member from Clay, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I wasn't going to speak on this, but uh, you baited me, I guess. And I love the opportunity to talk about equity in our education systems. You talk about sitting on the school board. I was um, a part of Indian education for a really long time. Um, and so you mentioned a couple things that I just want to address. As we talk about education, um, I think it's time that we all take an opportunity to understand that education is a lifelong mission. Um, and so I want to explain a couple things. Um, one, you talked about slavery being a stain on our history, and I want to talk about the stain that is really important to me is our boarding schools. Um, if some of you have noticed, uh, Canada has been uncovering thousands of our babies in unknown graves, um, and Secretary Holland is now approaching to do the same thing uh, in our nation. And just so you all know what this is going to do for us in our region, um, there's 365 boarding schools in the United States. 20, um, in 29 different states, 14 of those are in Minnesota, 12 of those are in North Dakota, 24 are in South Dakota, 13 in Wisconsin. So in our state and bordering states alone, there's 63 boarding schools. This is going to impact the future of our education for a very long time. We've known this has happened. These are things we do not talk about in education. It's amazing to me when I go out and do the work that I do, there is a lot of pieces of history that a lot of you all don't know. This is, um, this is gonna make a difference. And when you talk about these children and you refer to everybody as these children, to me, these are our children. We have to invest in our children and we have to do it through an equity lens and absolutely we need to close our opportunity gaps. Um, but you talk about educational racism, elimination of conversations is the biggest form of educational racism. So I just want to challenge you all as we talk about education today, that we do it from a really inclusive lens and we know that not everybody has the same experience. So if we could just move forward making sure that we're talking about these decisions for our children um, and the pain that some of this brings to some of us, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. The member from Mille Lacs, Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you for this conversation. And Representative Keeler, uh, our four contract schools are private schools. Uh, so, uh, you know, we do have a private school. I have one in my district, uh, Nashing at, uh, at Vineland. And so, you know, I think we're seeing the American Indians honor private education. Anyway, Representative Grunhagen, to get to your uh, amendment, which I support, I want to give you some comfort because 29 states presently have either a voucher, uh, an educational savings account, or a uh, tax credit scholarship. And three states like uh, Iowa, Montana, and I'm not sure, I think it's uh, one of the far northeastern states, uh, maybe Vermont, are working on uh, more school choice. But the reason that school choice has become such an important topic is that parents are looking for other options. They are looking for a foundation for their children. I have a parochial schools in uh, my district, other than the tribal school, and I know that all of those schools focus on foundation, uh, on the moral uh, foundation for children, and that's what parents are searching for. They are searching for something other than just that, that status quo, mundane, you know, the children go through the day, but, but their character is not uh, focused on, the qualities that bring about character uh, are not the focus, and that's part of, of uh, the entire educational system, is that we bring uh, that foundation to our children. So uh, as parents who talk to me, and I know these moms uh, to whom you have spoken, Representative Grunhagen, they're longing for another option. Just give us another option. And because many of them are low income, they're looking for this savings account. It is not going to hurt our public system. I think it's going to improve our districts and our charters. In fact, charters are ever growing because parents are seeing that as a viable source. So, you know, as we think about the future here in Minnesota, I think we need to really uh, listen carefully to some of the words of Representative Grunhagen as he stresses, you know, let's, let's listen to our parents. Let's honor the option that they want. Let's allow them to, to take their children to a school that is going to provide for them 
that everlasting a path that they want that also develops their character, that focuses on what makes uh, our nation a great nation or could make it a greater nation, and, and to fulfill those needs that parents are searching for, especially in our urban areas. You know, I have served in this legislature over 20 years and was a, a chair of education policy, so I visited with many, many parents uh, who are part of our minority community. And they would always beg me to look at other choices. You know, they, they were uh, Hispanic, they were African American heritage, they, uh, some of them uh, practiced Islam, so it was a wide variety. And uh, I just enjoyed those conversations so much. And that goes back, you know, eight to 10 years and even farther back than that, when I was a vice chair, to listen to parents asking us, is there not another opportunity for our children to be able to get well-educated? We need that. So let's, uh, let's support Representative Grunhagen's amendment and keep thinking about where can we place that other choice in our state. We have great charters, we have some great public schools, but we need another option. So members, let's vote green. The member from Olmsted, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And I think this amendment is empowering parents. And in this debate, perspective and background and is important because there are different communities, there are individuals Parents know that if they have more than one child, they're not identical. And sometimes you have to have a different choice, an option for the different children you have. You know, I volunteered, mentored um, in over two dozen schools. I've been in corporate programs that have tried to engage and improve schools. Been on the school board, special ed board. I, I've been in a lot of situations, seen a lot of different schools and communities. But one thing that's been pretty uniform is that when you engage the community, when you empower and engage the parents, that makes a big difference in the results and outcomes. The intent of this amendment is to empower the parents. And if the parents have that power and they look at the choices, they can still choose their regular school. They might choose for one of the students a different option. But we need to engage the parents and empower the parents because they know their children the best. And that's the kind of local control that makes a difference in the lives of the children. So if you don't like this amendment, I implore you, think about a way that you can come up and we can come together and engage the parents, give them power, give them choice, so that when they're engaged, we have a better shot for each individual student. And that's what this bill is about, each individual student and their success. And we disagree on approaches, but I honestly believe we all care about doing the best for the kids. So I'm gonna vote green, I hope you do too. The member from Wabasha, Representative Jarkowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Thank you, Representative Gruenhagen, for bringing forward this amendment. Representative Gruenhagen, you're bringing forward an amendment that is on the minds of many Minnesota families. Minnesotans are becoming upset and are losing their patience with our failed education system in Minnesota. And we heard from Representative Keeler representing the collectivist approach to education. Uh, the representative said that my kids and the kids of parents in my district are her kids. Representative Keeler, they are not your kids. 
They are the parents' kids. They are the family's kids. Your kids are not my kids, and my kids are not your kids. And you know what? Minnesotans are clamoring for this change that Representative Gruenhagen is bringing forward. They realize that the collectivist approach brought forward by the Minnesota Teachers Union and the Democrats in this state is failing them. I heard in the Education Finance Committee from a young lady who made it out unscathed and actually achieved success in spite of the 33% graduation rate at Minneapolis North High School. I admired that young lady for coming forward and speaking and thank God that she had the tenacity to escape that system and get the education she needed and, and got to be successful. We have to fix those systems in this state. We have to bring forward the competition that Representative Gruenhagen talked about. And members, thinking and talking, words make difference. Words, are, words matter. Saying there are kids only lends to the notion that the only approach to this is a collectivist approach. Well, the collectivism in this state has failed Minnesota families. And those parents who the kids belong to, their families, it's their kids, not our kids. Those parents will not be denied in this state. This issue is growing. Those parents are going to ask us to be accountable. They're already asking us to be accountable. The rallies are happening. They're going to get stronger over the next two years, members. And if you continue, Minnesota Democrats, to stick your head in the sand in denial of the reality of what families want, they want what they want. They don't want what Representative Keeler wants for them. They want what they want. And that's what we need to be here prepared to bring forward in the form of legislation, in the form of the way we fund our school districts and listen to the parents and families of our state. Not listen to the collectivism of the Minnesota Teachers Union that has brought forward failure throughout the Twin Cities in our education system. We have some very good and strong schools in this state. Many, many very strong, good schools are doing excellent jobs. But in the place that we stand today, in the twin of this city, there's huge problems. Members, it's time to pull our head out of the sand as a body and resist the political temptation the Minnesota Democrats have followed again and again and again to walk lockstep with the collectivist teachers union and not listen to the parents of Minnesotans. It's time for us to break away and do our duty constitutionally to our constituents as we told them we were going to come here to do. And that is to give them the choice in the education of their students, of their kids, of their kids, as they bring them forward to meet their dreams that they have for them and with them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. The member from Hennepin, Representative Dabney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, I rise to ask for a no vote on the Grunhagen Amendment. Members, the stability of a Republican form of government, depending mainly upon the intelligence of the people, it is the duty of the legislature to establish a general and uniform system of public schools. That is not just our moral responsibility, that's our constitutional responsibility here in Minnesota. Representative Drazkowski is right. We need to fix the systems that aren't working for Minnesota's students. Representative Grunhagen's solution is to abandon those students. It's to throw up our hands and say it's just too hard to invest in those students. It's just too hard to invest in their families and their communities. 
the richest country on the planet, a wealthy and successful state, and we just can't bring ourselves to do it. Representative Draskowski is right. My kids are my kids. Representative Draskowski's kids are Representative Draskowski's kids. But we're the adults in the room, and we are responsible for all the children to have opportunities to grow and develop and to succeed. The failure is not the children's. The failure is not the school's. The failure is us. Representative Grunhagen, you're right. If we keep doing what we're doing, we'll keep getting what we're getting. We begged, we implored the Senate to change what we're doing so we can change the experience of students in Minnesota schools so that they can follow their dreams, they can build their skills, they can achieve and succeed and build the next Minnesota. And the Senate would not do it. We've got one of the top school choice systems in the country and the largest opportunity and achievement gaps. Instead of washing our hands of the children who we have historically underinvested in, hear the voice of Representative Keeler speaking powerfully of the effect of boarding schools, parochial boarding schools, on the Native community and the trauma that has meant. Listen to the news of the horrors coming out of the Canadian parochial boarding schools. Members, one of the things I appreciate about working on public education is it's a place that we can be, where we can drop our ideologies and focus on our communities. And yet, Representative Grunhagen offers us nothing but an ideological response that doesn't improve the lives of students. It doesn't improve schools. It doesn't improve communities. Every child in Minnesota deserves access to a world-class education. Those children and their schools and their families deserves our best and our boldest leadership. The Grunhagen Amendment is not that. I ask for a no vote. Thank you. Representative Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Chair Daphne, a lot of that stuff we agree on, okay? It's just the solution is where we part ways. But members, I, I did want to just add this. You know, I, uh, when I was on the school board, I used to uh, write quite a few editorials too. And uh, one of the editorials I wrote was on whole language, inventive spelling, and creative writing, which, by the way, we were doing. And there was a particular teacher who was doing her doctorate on whole language, inventive spelling, and creative writing. And she took offense at an editorial I wrote in the paper. So she invited me into her classroom for a whole week to see her teach whole language, inventive spelling, and creative writing. She was a third grade teacher. She was very diligent. We have a lot of good teachers, okay? I'm not trying to denigrate any teachers because a lot of them uh, work very hard and are diligent. And I, you know, my years on the school board, I never met a teacher who didn't want to do a good job, all right? I met a lot of educational bureaucracy that made it difficult, difficult for the teacher to do a good job. That I met, <laughs> but not a teacher. Uh, but anyway, so I spent a, a week with her and, you know, a third grade teacher, but what she used to do, she had uh, an uh, assignment for the third grade teachers and they had to write sentences. But you know what? She allowed them to spell words however they wanted to, which is inventive spelling. So the word was in one, by the way, I got copies of this back at my office. The word was was spelled W-U-Z. And many other words were, were misspelled. And yet, at the end of that spelling, the children are given zero wrong, 100% right. So I said, how can you give that child 100% when they've made so many mistakes in the exercise? She said, we're grading effort, not accuracy. 
they'll eventually be able to figure out how to spell the word. I said, according to the National Right to Read, which I used to uh, spend a lot of time on, uh, you're developing bad habits in the children. So they wouldn't grammatically structure the, the uh, sentence properly. They wouldn't spell the words correctly, but yet the teacher was giving them zero wrong, 100%. That's the problem, members. Now, according to the National Right to Read, 20% of students will learn how to read no matter how you teach them. Either their parents help them or they figure it out or whatever. But 80% of students will not read to grade level if they're not taught the right instruction uh, approach, intensive systematic phonics. And members, I challenge you to do this. Talk to your parents and your grandparents. Now, I talked to my mom and my aunt. They spoke German at home and German at church. But when they went to public school, they learned English. And you know, I asked them, well, how did you learn it? You know what they said? Phonics. So they only knew German when they initially went to public school, but by, and they didn't graduate, my aunt graduated, my mom didn't. She just made it to elementary. And, uh, uh, but they learned English afterwards. We've got to promote the right instruction if you want to lift these children out of the achievement gap and give them a chance to become the minority. Members, please vote green. Further discussion? The clerk will take the roll. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? <clears throat> Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. Baker. Baker, I. Baker, I. Bernardi. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. Bliss. Bliss, I. Bliss, I. Bo. I get Bo, I. Bo, I. Franzen. Franzen, both yes. Franzen, I. Gomez. Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Hamilton. Hamilton, both no. Hamilton, <laughs> Hamilton, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Howard. Howard, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon. Lucero. Lucero. Lucero, green. Lucero, I. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Miller. Miller, I. Miller, I. Novotny. Novotny, I. Novotny, I. Sandstead. Sandstead, no. Sandstead, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? The clerk will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted.
Representative Detmer offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Detmer moves to amend House sign number two, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A8. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Madam Speaker and, and members. Again, this, uh, the A8 amendment, we could say it's a, an employment and career option amendment for the K-12 education omnibus bill. And if you're a freshman or if you haven't been here for at least uh, one term, uh, I should probably give you a little background on this amendment because, uh, and, and as, the, as the chair also knows that I've served on the education committee uh, several times. Uh, both in the minority and in the majority. And this uh, amendment uh, made it into the omnibus education bill. It went through the House, the Senate. It went to the governor's desk, Governor Dayton. And it was part of the omnibus bill. And at that time, Governor Dayton vetoed the whole omnibus bill. So I had to start all over again. And as you know me, um, many times it takes uh, several years to get bills through the, the legislature. I know when I first came on, I thought we needed education standards for health and physical education. And I worked uh, a couple years, thought I could, hey, I could get this done, but I found out I had to work across the aisle, I think as Representative Norton from uh, the Rochester area. We finally worked on the, the bill, so we got education uh, standards for the physical education and health education. Members, I bring this bill before you because uh, as an educator for 34 years, I had many students come to my office and talk about military um, service and also the trades. And over the years, I gave them advice. And when I got in the legislature here, I figured, well, maybe we need to encourage schools to invite the military recruiters from the various, now we have six branches, and also the different trades. We have several trades that we have a shortage of workers in right now. And what I did, I went out and visited the different trades, like where we train our electricians in St. Paul, where we train our carpenters in uh, here in the cities. I went up to Hinkley and toured the 49ers where they, they train the big heavy equipment operators. They put me on a backhoe and I got to dig a hole and fill it in again. Now I worked on a, I grew up on a farm, a dairy farm. And my first six years of education was in a one room schoolhouse just across from our farm. I would not trade that six years of education for anything and Mrs. Molnar, our teacher. And then we consolidated with a two-room schoolhouse. And yes, I had to walk uphill both ways to get to school in the wintertime. But that's, those six years of uh, elementary education was very rewarding to have that close to our farm where I grew up. But Ms. Madam Speaker and members, students need to know the different options that are out there for, for when they make a decision, whether to go to a four-year school, a two-year school, or to look at the opportunities in the military, the academies. And we want to allow these recruiters from the different branches and from the academies and ROTC opportunities and the different uh, trades to come into the schools, say when they have a college fair, invite them in. They don't have to come. My amendment says they don't have to come, but I've talked to these recruiters and we had, uh, they came through the, the Veterans Affairs Committee uh, last, last session and they said there's schools around the state that don't allow them to come in. Now I checked with my three districts that I represent, the public schools, and there's no problem there. They invite them in, they invite the trades in, but there's our schools that say, no, we don't want the trades or the recruiters in. 
and I think we are doing a disservice to students. They need to know the opportunities out there. Today in Minnesota, I was checking with the people down where they, we train the, the electricians just down the street. And I sat with them and I said what I'm trying to do for the recruiters and they said, well, we want to be part of that too. We want to, we want to come into our schools and talk about opportunities in the trades, the carpenters, the 49ers. We want, we want the opportunity to speak to students. And you know, if you become an electrician today in Minnesota, you get a five-year apprenticeship, you are paid, you get benefits, and after five years, the starting salary right now for an electrician in Minnesota is between seventy-five and eighty-five thousand dollars, and no college loans. We have students today that are hit with big college loans, but there's some good paying jobs out there in the trades. There's some great opportunities in the military, the academies. Right now, if you want to get to get into any one of the four military academies that we have in America, it's harder to get in those academies than it is to get in Harvard, Yale, some of your fancy colleges. You need to get an appointment. You need to get nominated by a congressperson or senator. And you have to go through interview process. It's very difficult. I know. My wife and I have twin sons that went through that process. And they were accept they first they were accepted ROTC scholarships, then West Point called them and said, We have appointments for both of you. And what an opportunity. They both have twenty one years in now. In fact, I'm a retired chief warrant officer, and I've said this to many people when I speak at groups. When they come home with the grandkids, in fact, they're they're coming home uh, over the fourth of July, Independence Day. One is coming in from Turkey and then heading off to Fort Lewis, Washington. But when they, when they come with the grandkids, I tell them I'm commander in chief. I have to salute them, by the way. They have rank on me. I'm a retired warrant officer. But when they come with the grandkids, I tell them I'm commander in chief when your mom's not there. And we've been blessed as a family. There's some great opportunities out there for our students. Now, we talked about a re refineries just the, the other day, a shortage of the trades. We need to contact students early in their high school careers, not just their senior year, but in their junior, sophomore, junior, freshman years, to talk to them about opportunities in the trades or in the, our armed forces. We are doing a disservice I know there's a lot of schools that I mentioned that open up their doors, allow these people to come in, but there's doors out there that are closed. I, I, I understand what happens sometimes when, when we say, well, we have a good bill here, and Chair Dabney, you do have a good bill. I'll be voting for it. I've served on the committee. I, I wanted to be on the committee th this, this term, but for some reason it didn't work out. But uh, I really believe that we, don't, we should not be looking at what the Senate's doing. We should be looking at what's, what's really important, what we're doing here on the House floor. And put things, these amendments that we have, I think they're very good amendments. And we need to put them on there and say, hey, this is what we believe in as a House of Representatives, and that we work together. I did request a hearing on this, on House File 198. And I don't know, uh, Chair Richardson, I didn't get a hearing. I can't speak uh, for, for the chair, but this is should have got a hearing, because it made it all the way to the governor's desk. Governor Dayton's desk before an omnibus bill. And I did talk to some of the members across the aisle. And I think in your heart, you know that this is something we should be doing for our students in our schools. Give them an option to ask questions during a college fair when these recruiters 
and the tradespeople can set up tables and talk about what they have to offer. Not everybody needs to go to a four-year school. Not everybody. Not every, and the military is not for everybody. The trades are not for everybody either. But tell me, as Americans, we rely on those people that serve in our armed forces. We rely on those people that are in our trades. When was the last time you asked an electrician to come into your home or a plumber? You know they're skilled. They know what they're doing or work on your vehicles. All these trades are important. And I think our students need to be aware of these early in their sc school careers. Members, you know that I don't get up and speak that much on the House floor. But when it comes to education, when it comes to people that are serving in our military, means a lot to me. I've been there, I've done it, and I know that uh, many of you have served in education fields, whether it's counselors, and how important it is that we as adults, that we as adults mentor those young people that we have. One thing I've learned over the years, those that have served in our military, is that they learn something about, number one, how to follow, take orders. Number two, how to be leaders. Because when you're done taking orders and your rank increases, and you have to be squared away for your rank to increase, you learn how to be a leader and how to mentor other people. And the trades, you don't have to go too far outside your own home when you know the importance that we have in the trades. And many of you, I know, work in the trades. So we need to share that information with our students. I would, I would advise everybody here to visit your school when you have a college fair and see who is actually there. Are the trades there? Are your recruiters there? Are they sharing information to our young people, our, men, our young men and women that are ready to head out the door into their employment and careers or college? So with that, this is probably the most long-winded I've ever been on the House floor. I know the chief clerk smiled there, and, he, and I think uh, he realizes that. And I, I just appreciate the time that I can s spend here on the House floor and share this important information. So with that, I ask uh, for your support, and I ask for a green vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I did already ask for a roll call. I know I'm pretty sure there are going to be other people who would like to hands? speak. Seeing 15 hands, there will be roll call. The member from Sherburn, Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Um, you know this is a very passionate thing for me, too, especially on the trade side of things. I have some cash, I think. Members, please meet, us, meet yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I have a lot of friends that went to college got their degree four or five years into it, found out that they didn't really care for that and they ended up going into the trades. One of the electricians that I hire, he's actually a lawyer. He's kept his law degree, he's found it beneficial when you get a bad customer to also be a lawyer while an electrician. Um, Representative Detmer made reference to some of the pay opportunities. Um, I've never been in a union, so I don't know the pay scale within the union stuff, but I do know in, in the general contracting world and. I often sub to other general contractors. Um, I, I, I met a, recently a young man who is 23 making 65 grand a year straight time with all the overtime he needs as a welding. Personally, I've had you know you, you, as much work as you want to do. I, I, I can't imagine in many of these trades, I have many painters and uh, 
uh, flooring guys, all making, well, they're in the six figures a year. No debt. Uh, there's actually a gentleman named Leon. He, he cleans sewers when, they, when you get backups in Bloomington. He doesn't make less than $1,000 a day, and he works all weekends. Darn near every realtor in the metro area knows Leon because he is always there to save them when the house is sold and suddenly there's a backup. So whether you do a two-year degree or a tech degree, a four-year four for college, if that's what you choose to do, so be it. But if you find out that you just like being outside or doing different things all the time, which I do, I have a hard time sitting still. Maybe it's the squirrel moments, I don't know. But, but for me, it's been a, a really, really uh, a different game changer because I was in the, in the white collar management side of the world and I've constantly found myself doing all the repairs within the business instead of hiring somebody else to do it, which led me down this lovely path. And now I'm sitting in a desk inside of a building. So, Representative Denver, I appreciate you bringing this forward. This is my understanding, this really is, there's no fiscal cost to this. There's, it's just a simple little bit of language. Um, I would hope that they would find this favorable, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Anoka, Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So what I want to do is take you on a little bit of a journey and tell you about the education side of what we're debating with this particular amendment, because we talk about wanting to take care of our children. In 1983, Staff Sergeant Larry Larson came to my high school and talked about the opportunities that the United States Army would be able to give to a young man such as myself. I, along with my best friend Larry Rogers, we raised our right hands and we joined the United States Army. And we said, I do solemnly swear that I'll support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all armies or against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I'll bear true faith and allegiance to the same and then I'll obey the officers and the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. In 1984, I shipped out to Fort Benning, Georgia. I became an infantryman. I joined the Blue Brotherhood, the, ba the Brotherhood of the, of the Blue Cord. I was assigned to the 3rd United States Infantry, the Old Guard, where I had the uh, honor of serving as a sentinel at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, Third Relief. I performed burials at Arlington National Cemetery where I laid to rest 1,100 of my sisters and brothers. I was then given the honor of attending the Defense Language Institute, Monterey, California, where I learned the Russian language and was stationed on the East German border. We just recently celebrated the fall of the wall I was there when history was made. I was there because a staff sergeant told me about the opportunities that a young man who came from a family of seven children, my father was a farmer and then a truck driver. His father, my grandfather Bernard, owned a farm down in Burnsville, Minnesota. We had the opportunity for education because of my service. I have four children, they graduated from college now because of my service in the military. This is a great opportunity to give back to our country and for our country to give back to us, but it starts with allowing recruiters to come into our schools and talk about the opportunity. Now, the opportunity is not for everyone. Not everyone has the um, ability to serve in the military, but for those that do, like Representative Eklund, and I appreciate your service more than anything else, Representative. We raised our right hand, just like every member here raised your right hand, and again, we swore today on that flag, and we pledged our allegiance. We need to support our children and education, and one of those opportunities is the ability for military service and bringing in recruiters to our schools to be able to talk about this opportunity. Members, thank you very much for listening to this. Please support this amendment. I think it would do a great service to our community, to our state, and to our nation. Representative McNaughtle, do you still wish to speak? Yes, Madam Speaker. Representative McDonough. 
Madam Speaker, I just rise quickly to uh, support Representative Detmer's uh, amendment and to thank members and anyone that's listening that some schools in our state won't allow trade organizations or trade schools or the military to uh, set up their booths and to instruct students on a future is unbelievable. Yeah. Thankfully, in my district, in my schools, they allow that. And I won't go into the necessities of the trades. We all, I hope, are aware as lawmakers, we certainly should be, and know the uh, vacancies that we have for good skilled labor. But I'll quickly share with you the committee that I was on with Representative uh, from Winona, uh, Pulowski. He, had a, he was the chairman of the Industrial Education Bill uh, Committee. And it was an excellent committee. And there we talked about the trades and schools and how important it is. So Representative Pulowski, I hope that you do support this uh, amendment because in it, in committee, we heard from many schools and school administrators in your district how important the trades are that we uh, educate our kids and give them the opportunity to learn a good skilled labor, that they can make a good living, a good healthy living in our state. So members, I rise to support this. I see no reason whatsoever that any of you wouldn't support it whatsoever. So please members vote green for Representative Detmer's amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Carleton, Representative Sunday. Oh. No? Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Swazinski, aye. Where the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet. Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. Baker. Baker, aye. Baker, aye. Bliss. Bliss, aye. Bliss, aye. Bo. Bo, aye. Bo, aye. Franzen. Franzen, aye. Franzen, aye. Gomez. Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Lucero. Lucero. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Noor. Noor. Novotny. Novotny, I. Novotny, aye. Sandstead. Sandstead, no. Sandstead, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? Swazinski, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Representative Winkler. Lay the bill on the table first. Madam Speaker, I move that House File 2 be laid on the table. 
The clerk will report the motion. Winkler, Winkler moves that House Hall number two be laid on the table. Representative Winkler. Oh. This is a, a non-debatable motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say nay. No. The motion prevails and the amendment, the motion, <laughs> the motion prevails and the bill is laid on the table. Messages from the Senate. Now we will revert to messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the Senate refuses to concur in the House amendments to the following Senate file. Senate file number nine, an act relating to state government. The Senate has respectfully requested a conference committee be appointed thereon. The Senate has appointed as such committee, Senators Pratt, Rarick, Housley, Dreheim, and Champion. The message is signed, Kalar Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Nor moves that the House accede to the request of the Senate and that the Speaker appoint a conference committee of five members of the House to meet with a like committee appointed by the Senate on the disagreeing votes of the two Houses on Senate File Number 9. Representative Nor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That's my motion. Uh, we will be going to the conference with the bill. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The motion prevails. The next bill in the calendar is House File 33. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 33, number two on the calendar of the day, an act relating to health, the first engrossment. There are amendments at the desk. If there's no objection, we will let the author explain the bill before we act on amendments. I recognize the author, Representative Liebling. Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and good afternoon, members. So what you have before you in House File 33 is a vehicle that is uh, the Health and Human Services vehicle for, for this special session. Our intention is to send this over to the Senate, um, which will amend the bill with the agreed upon language in the Health and Human Services bill, which is, um, has been um, explained to members in an informational hearing yesterday. So that's really all there is to be said about this particular bill, Health, House File 33. Thank you. Discussion. Oh. There are amendments at the desk. Representative Baker offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <laughs> Baker moves to amend House Law number 33, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A2. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I, uh, I, I bring the, mem uh, the amendment forward. And I want to first of all thank uh, Chair Liebling for allowing some uh, movement on the um, youth uh, mental health beds with Prairie Care. So um, I just think that uh, doing that was a big step in the right direction. I know it wasn't easy to uh, work through some of those things, but I also want to thank um, uh, Chair Fisher and for the work that he's been doing this year with the Behavioral Health Committee. Really felt it was a, uh, a good work that we did this year. Members may recall that when the bill was initially on the House floor a couple months ago, um, I had an amendment to fix the drafting error in Chair Leland's bill. The original bill we voted on a couple months ago today uh, barred the Prairie Care from adding these beds. Members will recall that in the weeks leading to the floor, uh, consideration of the HHS bill that night after night, there were no beds available anywhere in the state. Children and teens were being warehoused in ER rooms around the state, deteriorating instead of getting care and parents were, had nowhere to really turn for help. Members, I'm sorry to report that things are not a lot better. Last night, there was only one child psych bed available in the entire Twin Cities. So this bill has some good news. 30 additional child beds uh, are coming to Prairie Care in 2022 instead of 2023. That's a big move and we're really grateful for that. Again, thank you, Chair, for changing your mind and accepting the Senate's language to help our sick kids. That being said, 30 beds is just a start on what is needed. 
Uh, 30 beds will help, but many more are needed. That is why I have an amendment that reinstates Chair Fisher's language that was in the original Liebling bill. Chair Fisher's provision would have allowed any hospital to add psych beds without going through the moratorium process if they meet the criteria. I remember Chair Liebling saying during the debate on my previous amendment several months ago that, that uh, Chair Fisher's language in her bill would encourage hospitals to add needed psych beds by waiving that public interest review process. Well, the need is still there. Even with the 30 beds granted to Prairie Care, the Fisher language is gone. I'd like to ask Chair Liebling a question if she would yield. Representative Liebling, will you yield? Yes, I will, Madam, Chair, Madam Speaker. And, Representative and thank Baker. You, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Chair Liebling. Um, can you give us some background about why the bill doesn't include the language that was sent to conference? Representative Liebling. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, the bill before you, uh, Representative Baker, is a vehicle bill, so it really has very little in it. I assume that you're really asking about the uh, delete everything amendment that was heard yesterday in committee. And so I'll, I'll answer your question as though you had asked about that, because I think that is your meaning. So um, first of all, let me just correct the record. Prairie Care never brought a bill for 30 beds or any beds or any exception to the moratorium. What Prairie Care did was come in and try to open up the exemption that's in Representative Fisher's language, which was not a drafting amendment. It was draft, not a drafting error. It was drafted. It, it might have had a minor error, but it was drafted as, for the most part, as intended to require that this could only be with a, a um, only a, uh, hospital with an emergency room would be eligible for this permanent exception to the bed moratorium. Um, the language you brought tried to open up that much, much wider with a much broader permanent exemption, which we uh, voted down as the bill left the floor. So we did carry Representative Fisher's language. The bottom line is that the Senate refused to accept it. We tried to push this, we were unsuccessful. One thing, however, that we were successful in getting was some other language that was in Representative Fisher's bill about when beds are being closed and moved within a corporate system, that the entity would have to first replace any mental health beds or SUD beds that are being shut down. So we were successful in keeping that part of Representative Fisher's great work, but unfortunately, the Senate just would not accept this language. Representative Baker. Thank you, uh, Chair Liebling, for that. I I, uh, I can appreciate that again in the final hours of negotiating the final bill. I know it's always tricky, but again, um, the House certainly recognizes the need for mental health beds. Um, I still would like to um, add the amendment and, and ask members, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker, if I could have a roll call on this as well. Seeing 15 hands, there will be roll call. Representative Madam Baker. Speaker, again, I'll... Yes, just to wrap up, I just want to ask members to support this again. We all care about mental health and mental health beds. I hope that we can see this and, and move it forward. So thank you very much. Further discussion? Madam Speaker. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just um, before, I don't know if uh, anyone else wanted to speak on this. I just would ask members to vote no on the amendment, as I mentioned, this we all voted for this as the bill left the floor. So we, we believe this is a good amendment. We believe this should happen, but uh, we do have an agreement that um, with the Senate and this unfortunately is not in it. So it would be a futile gesture at this point. So I would ask members to vote no. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take Madam. the roll. Oh, Representative Baker. Well, just a, just a final comment, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I, I don't want to belabor this either. You know, precedent was kind of shown yesterday that the, once the deals are done, doesn't mean that we can't add amendments as we did yesterday in the jobs bill. So I'm just hoping that members and especially the members in the majority would consider these kind of things as, uh, as still a signal to send it back over there to get it right. And then they, it'll come back whether it's in it or not. But uh, I appreciate that. But I think we set precedent yesterday with uh, saying that there are times we can we can move away from that deal that supposedly was done. So with that, I will again, just urge a green vote members. Thank you. The clerk would take the roll.
Those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? <clears throat> Bonner. Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. Baker. Baker, I. Baker, I. Bliss. Bliss, I. Bliss, I. Bo. Bo votes, I. Bo, I. Franzen. Franzen, I. Franzen, I. Hamilton. Hamilton, I. Hamilton, I. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Heinzman. Heinzman. Lucero. Lucero, yes. Lucero, I. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. Murphy. Murphy, no. Murphy, no. Novotny. Novotny, I. Novotny, I. Sandstead. Sandstead, no. Sandstead, no. Swazinski. Ah. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Have all those mo members voted who wish to vote? Oh, how do I move this? Okay. The clerk will close the roll. Heinzman votes aye. Heinzman votes aye. So we got to add them? So 50, 50, oh, you got them in there? I did not. No. 57 ayes, 68 nays. There being 57 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Representative Haley offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Haley moves to amend House Law number 33, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A3. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Haley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, my amendment pulls up the language that we've talked about for months to end the governor's emergency powers. The Senate passed something, I believe, yesterday, ending the powers. Uh, there were other st states around the country this week that also ended their powers, New York City, for example. It is time. We have been here 13 days in special session, and we have yet to talk about this. So this is a perfect opportunity this afternoon, folks, to get this done. Again, we've, we've seen this language before, and we've debated it on the House floor, so I can quickly summarize the amendment. It allows the commissioner to declare a public health disaster, that is language that we need for the federal government in order to continue to receive federal SNAP money, which is food stamp, food stamp money. And it allows uh, DHS to continue to procure vaccines and run vaccination and testing clinics. That is all it does. It ends the COVID peacetime emergency. It does not allow the governor to declare an additional COVID peacetime emergency. Only allows the commissioner, the Department of Human Services, to procure vaccines, run testing sites, and provides the language in statute that allows us to continue to receive food stamp money. I ask for a green vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion? Madam Speaker. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, thank you, Representative Haley, for your um, continued uh, work on these issues. And um, I've appreciated working with you over your time in the legislature. And I know that you are a member who is thoughtful and, and tries to come up with solutions. Unfortunately, this is an amendment that just isn't workable. First of all, just on the issue about ending the emergency powers, um, the governor has announced he's ending the emergency powers August 1st. And so there are things that have to be, uh, I understand, wound down in the meantime. 
that's one thing. But that's not all that's in this amendment, as you referred to. Um, we've never heard this, in, to my knowledge, in a health or human services committee. And I, it's just really interesting to me that this is the commissioner of human services who's being given the uh, authority to declare an emergency rather than it says in consultation with the commissioner of health, but that's very curious to me since it's really more a health issue than a human services issue. Um, also, it's uh, interesting in this amendment that um, the way this ends is there's absolutely no provision in here for the legislature to end the emergency whatsoever if it was declared by the commissioner. Um, so I find that kind of interesting too. So I, I, you know, I appreciate that you're always thinking about these things, and that's a great thing. And um, you know, very uh, pleased to continue working with you on a whole host of issues. But I would ask members to vote no. I think this is unworkable and uh, and doesn't belong in this bill in the first place. But just vote no, members. Representative Haley, Madam Speaker, I request a roll call. Seeing 50 hands, there will be roll call. Representative Haley. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Chair Liebling. Um, Chair Liebling, the, the reason that we call this out for DHS is because my understanding is that's where the federal SNAP money flows. So that is why I um, use that language. Um, and again, the, the criteria that the governor has put forth over months uh, have been taken care of. The eviction moratorium language was passed a couple days ago off this floor. And this bill addresses the other two things that the governor says he needs. And I find it curious that there's continued objection to this language or any other language to end the emergency powers, and yet your side of the aisle has offered no solutions. Nothing. So as I said last month and the month before and the month before and the month before, what constitutes an end? Minnesotans are ready, they have been ready. This is not an emergency anymore. It hasn't been an emergency for months. And this is definitely an opportunity today to cast your vote and do what Minnesotans expect us to do and move on with our lives and restore the legislature as a co-equal branch of government. We're passing a budget, but we don't have the courage to end the emergency powers. Explain that to Minnesotans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I urge a green vote. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Haley, for bringing this forward. Uh, I appreciate the work that you have put in um, to actually find something that uh, would end the emergency powers. Uh, I know the Senate has voted to end the emergency powers already. They did that yesterday, I think. Um, so uh, this gives us an opportunity to actually end them. Um, I wasn't going to stand and speak on this, but um, when I heard the chair of the HHS, HHS committee say that this was unworkable, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't let that go. To say that this is unworkable when we have for 16 months been shut out of the process by a governor who doesn't care about the legislature at all, and you have blocked any efforts by the legislature to actually be involved or have input in the process, when the emergency was over probably 14 months ago, the emergency, the need for a governor to act without legislative approval, quickly, that emergency hasn't existed for over a year. But Democrats want to block everything to let their governor just run things unchecked. Un this language is unworkable, according to the chair. That is an insult to Representative Haley, who has actually showed up to work to do her job. And it's unfortunate that you think that people who actually care about their job and want to get something done, that you think their product is unworkable because it doesn't let your governor of your party do whatever he wants for as long as he wants. Minnesotans know what's going on. Minnesotans know that this governor has overreached, that he has overreacted. The data and the science are clear. 
the steps that the governor put in place were a gross overreaction. They were not backed by science. They were not backed by data. And we saw businesses economically devastated because of this governor's actions. When the neighboring state, Wisconsin, literally had the same spike and the same drop last October and November that we did. The difference, we were completely locked down, everybody wearing masks, restaurants completely closed, no kids in schools. In Wisconsin, completely open. And if I charted those two lines on a, on, a, on a chart with different colored lines and didn't tell you which one was which, you wouldn't know the difference. And what that is, is that science telling you that this governor was and has been dead wrong. And you have been an accessory to that. And you describe people who actually want to do their jobs as unworkable. You know what's unworkable? a Democrat majority in the Minnesota House, and I'm gonna work my ass off to make sure that we put an end to that in the next election. And I have a feeling Minnesotans are gonna support that pretty strongly. Members, I think you know how to vote on this one. Further discussion. See no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? <coughs> Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. Baker. Baker, I. Baker, I. Bliss. Bliss, I. Bliss, I. Franzen. Franzen, I. Franzen, I. Garofalo. Garofalo. Grossel. Grossel. Hamilton. Grossel, I. Hamilton, I. Hamilton, I. Yeah. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Lucero. Lucero, yes. Lucero, I. Rasmussen. Rasmussen, I. Swazinski. Swazinski. Have all those members who voted wish to vote? Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Grossel, aye. Grossel, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Representative Doubt offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Doubt moves to amend House File Number 33, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A4. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I appreciate the opportunity to bring this forward. Um, this amendment represents uh, an extension of the reinsurance program that we all know has been so successful and helped Minnesotans uh, by stabilizing the individual marketplace and uh, kept uh, rates from increasing um, at the rate of about 30% per year uh, in that individual marketplace. Um, and if you remember, I'll just take you back in time a little bit um, to when Obamacare uh, came to Minnesota and Democrats brought that uh, Obamacare uh, by way of our, our uh, 
uh, Minsure and our, our individual marketplace, um, we were seeing uh, rates increase uh, 30 percent year over year in that individual marketplace. And none of the promises that Democrats had made uh, uh, to Minnesotans had come true. Uh, they kept saying there was going to be four. 100,000 people in this marketplace, or 500,000, or 600,000, um, and ultimately there's there's about 165,000 Minnesotans in this uh, individual marketplace, and and because of that, um, and there actually were less, uh, because of that, um, this marketplace is the place where um, some of our highest uh, risk and and unhealthiest, uh, or or uh, the people who access. Uh, health care uh, at, a, at a greater rate uh, reside in this in this risk pool. So um, what Minsher did uh, was to stabilize that individual marketplace and uh, prevent increases uh, of 30 percent year over year. And, and really, actually, rates have gone down since we put this program in place. Um, and the program has been so successful. Uh, we were the first state in the country to do it. Um, and since we did it, 13 other states have followed suit. Uh, and it has been um, incredibly successful in all of the places that have tried it. Um, it's, it's so uh, well supported that uh, the Star Tribune editorial board endorses this program. Uh, Senator Abel, Amy Klobuchar has been a, a very strong advocate for this program. Um, and uh, we know uh, that this is what it's going to take to make sure that Minnesotans don't continue to see uh, those big rate increases. So um, I do know that uh, this year uh, it was uh, Democrats' number one priority to make sure that this program went away. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, and in this chamber we don't get to question someone's motives, um, but obviously uh, I think everybody knows the destruction and damage that would happen to Minnesota families uh, if this were to not be adopted and, and we did not continue reinsurance. Um, I do know there is a kind of a substandard version of reinsurance that's being discussed and debated. I'm hearing that it potentially uh, uh, could be uh, inserted over in the Senate. Um, uh, but that is a program uh, that, that will, frankly, not protect Minnesotans from uh, increases and, and really is a, a subpar and substandard uh, version of reinsurance. Um, this is a full reinsurance for two years. This does not take any general fund money. Um, I do. I will note that there is a transfer in this of $247 million from the general fund. Um, that actually is not new money. Um, that is just the money that was stolen from this account in, in the last two years. Uh, there was $142 million in 2019, um, and then there was $105 million last year. So we're just putting the money back into the account that was for this program, um, that is for uh, uh, making sure that people have uh, affordable access to health care and health coverage. Um, so we're just making that transfer back from the general fund, and that's money that was transferred out over the last two years. So we're just making this account whole again. Um, that will actually leave this program, uh, according to our estimations, uh, with uh, about $57 million of surplus at the end of the two-year period. So that's how successful this program has been. We don't need to put additional money into it. It will just continue to run off of our initial investments and the money that we have received from the federal government uh, to operate this program. Um, I think we've all heard a, a lot about the stories of people that have been impacted uh, by Obamacare and the disaster that Obamacare has been uh, here in the state of Minnesota. Um, the, uh, the, you know, I think the Democrats would, would want Minnesotans to believe that more people are insured today uh, through Obamacare and, and while uh, by the technical definition of insurance, that probably is true. Uh, by the realities that Minnesotans face, um, it is far from true. Um, I personally do not consider uh, a family of four paying $3,000 a month for health care coverage and then having a $13,000 deductible before they can access one penny of coverage from a provider. I do not consider that to be health insurance. Um, and that's what Obamacare brought to us uh, here in Minnesota. Um, that means a family of four, uh, and I do know families that are impacted by numbers exactly like those. This, these are not hypothetical situations. These are real people, real Minnesotans, um, and this is what they were uh, impacted by. 
uh, and many of them just made decisions to drop their health care altogether, health coverage, because they couldn't afford it. Um, but you're talking about almost $50,000 out of pocket for a family of four before they received one penny of, of uh, health insurance coverage. Um, and that is absolutely not acceptable. Um, but that is the Democrats' plan for health care and health coverage here in the state of Minnesota. So, um, members, I would ask you to vote uh, green on this. Um, and we can leave this successful program in place. Uh, just as a recap, uh, this would authorize the program to continue through 2028. Um, it would provide, uh, uh, reinstate the funding that had been taken out of this account over the last two years. Um, so there'd be $247 million returned to the uh, premium security account from the general fund that was taken out over the last two years. Um, and I'll remind you, there's almost $106 million uh, still in that premium security account. So with all of those, that will fully operate this program for the next two years. Uh, Minnesotans can have some security uh, that they're, uh, they will have health insurance and, and um, not see huge spikes and increases. Um, and then we'll have uh, uh, $57 million left uh, at the end of that, that two-year period. Um, this also does instruct the department to obtain a waiver from the federal government. We are the first state uh, to put this program in place. We got a five-year waiver when we did that. Um, we do need to, to uh, renew that waiver from the federal government for another five-year period, and, and this bill instructs them to do that as well. So I think that covers all of the details. Uh, there probably are some members who uh, also want to speak about the importance of this program and, and, and why it needs to be kept in place. And um, I certainly uh, will sit back and listen to the uh, debate a little bit, and then, Madam Speaker, I'll likely have some closing comments before we move to a vote. But I also, uh, Madam Speaker, if it's okay, I'd like to request a roll call vote on this amendment. Seeing 15 hands, there will be roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, any further discussion? The member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I urge members to vote no, and I'll speak after um, the Republicans are finished with their speeches. Representative Schultz. Okay. Well, I know, um, <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker, I know how many people love reinsurance in this body and in the Senate, but I personally um, am not a big fan of reinsurance. And even more so now because President Biden and the Democrats in charge at the federal level have helped families buy health insurance on our exchange by capping the premium amount people spend, so it's no more than 8.5% of their income. So that really helps uh, make it more affordable, but also helps stabilize the market. So I really think uh, we don't need it this year. And in the amendment, it is extended through 2028. And I will say, uh, Representative Doubt, that the states that now do reinsurance learned a lot of what not to do from Minnesota. Because 12 of the 15 states with reinsurance use a different way to fund it. They use a premium assessment rather than the way Minnesota funds it. So if we do continue reinsurance in the future, I urge members to look at what 12 of the 15 states are doing in their reinsurance program. Um, the other, um, um, issue I want to uh, bring up about reinsurance is that it doesn't really address the cost growth of health care. And other members have made this point before. Families are buying policies with very high deductibles. So we may, reinsurance may have, and subsidies may help reduce the premium, but they're buying policies with high deductibles for that lower premium. And we really need to establish programs to reduce the cost growth of healthcare. Reinsurance will not do that. So we as a body need to come together and figure out a way to reform health care and pay providers in a different way to reduce the cost growth of health care so we can have affordable coverage for everyone in our state. So members, I urge a no vote on this amendment, and I'm happy to talk about reinsurance when we have the full HHS bill in front of us. Thank you. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And 
thank you, Representative. Appreciate the comments. I know at the beginning you said there were a lot of people here and in the Senate. Uh, I'm not sure if that was tongue in cheek or not, but uh, that supported reinsurance. Um, I'd also have you add to that list of people that strongly support reinsurance, uh, Congresswoman Angie Craig and Senator Amy Klobuchar, uh, as two very strong proponents of that program. So uh, we certainly appreciate their support on this as well. Um, you know, I, I would say uh, I appreciate your comments. Um, and, you know, there, there are some programs in place. Uh, I will assure all members of this body that if this is adopted, um, there is no one who will do worse. Everyone will do the same or better under this program. If we don't adopt this, there's a large number of people who will be hurt incredibly bad and have 30% increases in their premiums. That is a fact, regardless of what federal money comes into place. Um, because what happens here is you will take $300 million of state money that was for this purpose, um, that originally came out of the health care access fund that was for providing affordable access to health coverage for Minnesotans. You've transferred $247 million of that to the general fund to use it for other things, not healthcare related, which is a whole separate issue. Um, but I assure you, if we do not adopt this amendment, you can pretend that some federal money is gonna come parachuting in here and, and is gonna save the day, but I assure you it will not, right? You will have at least one third of the people in this marketplace who will get hammered with a 30% increase. That is a fact. Minnesota will not lose one dime of federal money whether we do this or don't do this. We're going to get the same amount either way. I've talked to the Commerce Department about that. They agree with that. We're going to get the same amount of federal help in Minnesota whether we pass this or not. By saying no to this, you're going to remove the, the uh, and I'm, I'm sure I know why you want to, right? You've already spent the money. You already spent it on last year's bonding bill and spent it to balance your budget that you couldn't control the spending in, in, in 2019, right? But I want you to explain that to the Minnesota families that are going to see those 30% increases next year. Because Minnesotans will be hurt by this. You can pretend like they won't. I, remi I, I remember the time when you were trying to cut nursing homes by $68 million or $67 million, and you were pretending like you weren't. And Minnesota seniors, the most vulnerable in our society, who we should be caring for the most and the best that we can, and you were going to hurt them. And that's exactly what would happen here. So, um, and I'll also remind uh, you members and, and for those watching at home, that what we just heard from the Democratic Party is that what we need to do is reduce the cost of health care in the state of Minnesota, and that's the ultimate answer. And their answer on how to do that is to increase the cost of health care for Minnesotans. And that's what their plan does, that's what their plan has done, and that's what their plan will do. And we know that because we know what our insurance marketplace looked like before reinsurance was in place. We know what it looked like. And if that same thing will happen again, we already know that. We don't have to speculate. We don't have to guess. We know that Minnesotans will be hurt. And once this vote happens, we know that Democrats are the people that want to hurt them. So members, this is your opportunity to do the right thing. Let's put the reinsurance program in place. Let's make sure that these families have some stability. And in the meantime, if Democrats who hold gavels and have the ability to actually make a difference in this chamber over the next year and a half, then prove it. Prove that you can actually do something instead of blocking the last little bit of help that these people have. And for most of them, this is all that stands between them and having no health insurance at all. And you know exactly what you're doing and you're doing it intentionally to them. So Minnesotans, uh, please pay attention. And Democrats, this is your last opportunity uh, to help these folks. So please vote green. The member from Fillmore, Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And let's take ourselves back about 
four years, 2017, when many counties in outstate Minnesota had no markets available or just one carrier available because what the decimation created by Obamacare. Then in 2017, I carried a bill called the reinsurance bill. We were charting new territory. We were the first. And I do wish to call out and thank Senators Amy Klobuchar and Congresswoman Craig uh, for their help. Uh, I don't think we could have done it without them. Uh, but they could see the need, and in fact, I believe Congresswoman Craig is carrying the bill nationally currently uh, to do this, make it available na nationwide. So when my good friend from Duluth made a couple comments, I, I found them quite comical, actually. We don't need it this year. Yes, we do need it this year. We need it this year, we need it next year, the next year, and the next year, because if we don't do it, there's one party that will be responsible in the Minnesota House for raising people's rates, and I think we're being conservative at 30%. Uh, I think we'll see 40 to 50 percent. Then my good friend, friend from Duluth said, well, it doesn't address cost growth, the growth in cost. Neither does anything else. And I agree with my friend from Duluth that that should be addressed, but this is not the time or place to do that. The HHS bill we're going to be seeing in the next uh, few hours here doesn't do anything to control costs that I could see. So that's really a straw person argument right there. Reinsurance saved the individual market. And in the district I'm so fortunate to represent, that's a lot of folks. It's a much higher percent than we have statewide because I have a lot of small independent business uh, people, a lot of farmers. And really when you think about what the Biden administration has done, could that help some? possibly for some people. But reinsurance has been the most successful program that this state has put forward. In fact, other states copy it. So why in the world would my good friends on that side of the aisle be trying to destroy reinsurance when it has worked so well? Get rid of some programs that haven't worked. There's a lot of them in state government. This isn't one of them. This program has been extremely successful we need to support uh, Leader Doubt's amendment here and get this passed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Goodhue, Representative Haley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you, Leader Doubt, for this amendment. And thank you, Chair Davids, for your work on this program so many years ago that have helped Minnesotans all over the state. I wanted to correct a couple things um, that were said uh, across the aisle. When you said the federal government passed the ARPA credits and set a limit of 8.5% of somebody's income, that they shouldn't pay more than that in their health insurance, that is correct. And the ARPA subsidies will help a lot of Minnesotans, but they will not help everybody. And these numbers have been verified by, by Commerce. ARPA will help about 43% of the people that buy in the individual market. That means 57% will not be helped. No other state that has reinsurance, that's also getting the ARPA credits, is ending reinsurance. No other state is ending reinsurance. You seem to think that, you know, just rich people are going to get rate increases. Reinsurance stabilizes the market and keeps rates low for everybody, even the people that will get the ARPA credits. Uh, let me tell you who won't benefit. Uh, a 26-year-old in Cass County making $65,000 per year currently pays $354 a month on a silver plan. They do not qualify for financial assistance. This goes away. That individual will see a 30% increase, bringing their monthly premium to $425. They will not receive ARPA subsidies. And what we've what we've heard from the industry is that this will cause as much as 6,000 Minnesotans to opt out. So that's what you're doing. You're raising rates for Minnesotans, but you're also going to create the problem of more people foregoing health insurance. This is crazy. Crazy. Another person who won't benefit. 
A single person age 25 making $55,000 a year in the Twin Cities does not benefit from ARPA. Those are, that's your constituent I'm talking about. Not just my farmers, your constituent. 25 year old making $55,000 a year. Without reinsurance, their premium for the second lowest silver plan will go up 30% from $2,300 in 2021 to $3,400 in 2022. And since that dollar amount will only represent 6.1% of that person's, the 25-year-old making 55,000, only 6% of their income, that coverage is supposedly affordable. They will not receive ARPA credits. That is what is going to happen all over the state. The plan, that you've apparently signed off on will cause 50,000 Minnesotans to see at least a 15% increase next year. 50,000. And then without reinsurance, the following year, 30% increase for 35,000 Minnesotans. Those are the facts. Thank you, Representative Doubt, for your work on this. Minnesotans will remember who fought for them. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? <coughs> Bonner. <coughs> Bonner, Baker, Baker, I, Baker, I, Bliss, Bliss, I, Bliss, I, Franzen, Franzen, I, Franzen, I, Hamilton, Hamilton, I, Hamilton, I, Houseman, Houseman, no, Houseman, no, Lucero, Lucero, Red. Lucero? No. Lucero, no. Lucero, no. Munson? Munson, no. Munson, no. Pearson? Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? The clerk will close the roll. There being 52 ayes and 72 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Representative Albright offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Albright moves to amend House Bill number 33, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A6. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, the A5, A6 amendment in your packet, uh, I want to draw your attention back to the events of uh, May and June of last year. We can all recall the stories of businesses lost, of livelihoods that literally went up in flames. But along with those businesses were pharmacies. Pharmacies like Walgreens, Target, CVS, Seward, Bonadur, Twin Cities, and Juba. 
And the reason that it's very compelling to bring this amendment before you is that I don't know that we've taken a proper accounting or understood what happened after that civil unrest of May and June of last year with the drugs that were housed in those pharmacies. We talk a lot about drugs and uh, health and human services. I want to draw your attention to a number of drugs, Schedule I drugs, that are kept by pharmacies on a regular basis to provide relief on a prescriptive basis for their patients. THC, dicetylmorphine, methadone, Demerol, Percocet, Ritalin, morphine, codeine, hydrocodone. Members, the, the purpose of this amendment is to find out what happened in those communities where those pharmacies were served after, to find out whether or not from a law enforcement perspective or from a mental health perspective, if there was an increase in overdoses or in drug trafficking. I can only imagine, sadly, after the Board of Pharmacy and the BCA completed that report, what we might find. These are devastating drugs that do devastating damage when they are abused. And candidly, for some, it might have been their first opportunity, and now they're addicted. And the loss of a life potential because of not knowing what happened. Members, I think we can all agree, drug abuse and drug trafficking should be addressed in this legislature at every opportunity because of the cost it has in so many different levels to our society and to our state. And with that, Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call and I would urge members to support the A6. Seeing 50 Thank hands, you. there will be roll call. Further discussion? Madam Speaker. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just would urge members to vote no on the amendment. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. Will the clerk call all the names of members who haven't voted yet? Bonner. Bonner. <clears throat> Baker. Baker, yes. Baker, aye. Bliss. Bliss, aye. Bliss, aye. Franzen. Franzen, aye. Franzen, Franzen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Lucero. Lucero, yes. Lucero, aye. Munson. Munson, aye. Munson, aye. Murphy. Murphy. 
Zhang T. Zhang T, no. Zhang T, no. Bonner. Bonner, aye. Bonner, aye. Bonner votes no. Bonner changes from aye to nay. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? The clerk will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Representative Schumacher offers the following amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schumacher moves to amend House Bill number 33, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded DE1. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. The DE1 amendment is the by far the largest amendment I've ever brought to this House floor, spending nearly $19 billion. And so I'm sure everyone will be excited to be voting for this. And members, the DE1 is actually the agreement uh, that came between the House majority, the Senate majority, and the governor. And it's the bill that we expected to be discussing today. Um, it's expected, it, it was expected uh, to be brought forward to us today so that we could have a debate on that. It's what we expected to be able to discuss today and have an open dialogue about what's actually in the bill. But instead, we're going to send off a bill that does not have uh, this agreement onto it, that does not uh, fund our state government in the health and human service area in this. Instead, we're going to send out a, a million dollar bill that um, will not be funding government. None of what we need to have happen today will happen today, and this DE amendment is discussing what we should have uh, coming in today. This amendment and the agreement in total that we'll be discussing now tomorrow uh, focuses on the expansion of public health insurance and public health care, but does very little to rein in the cost of health care for the state and the general public. It expands state subsidized health insurance through the Min Minnesota Care Program for people so that they have access to, uh, for people who have access to other insurance. It puts the untracked NFIP cash grants into automatic inflation, taking the legislature and their decision making process out of what those cash grants are used for. It bails out the Department of Human Services for providing tribes and counties over $37 million in bad information just two years ago that the federal government had to uncover for us. There are a couple of things that I wish we could be uh, able to support today with this DE amendment and continue that. There are increases for our hardworking PCA workers throughout the state and what that will mean for them and their livelihoods as they care for some of our most vulnerable in the state. We're seeing the same thing with the assisted living uh, rates that will be adjusted in this. We see a solution for the future of telehealth in this amendment that we would be very happy to support today. We also see reforms in child care and licensure changes that we would have liked to support today. But in the end, those are small portions to the overall agreement that came between the House majority, the Senate majority, and the governor. And for those reasons, I uh, would urge that we not support the bill that moves forward. I will be withdrawing this amendment uh, as, we, as we do this because we know that the Senate is going to be sending over what we'll really talk about, and we'll talk about those measures when they come up. And so, Madam Chair, I withdraw the DE1 amendment. Representative Schumacher withdraws a DE1 amendment. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill a third reading. Third reading, House file number 33. Third reading. Madam Speaker. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to re-refer House File 33 back to the Human Services Committee, and I request a roll call vote. Seeing 50 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, you know, I think 
back to the first day that I was sworn in here, and I remember somebody told me that when you get uh, sworn in on that first day and you walk into this magical chamber, um, that you should walk up the front steps of the Capitol to get a full perspective and sense for what it is uh, that this job entails that you're about to take on. And I, I'll tell you, we get to work in probably one of the most amazing places that I could imagine. And so I want to ask each of you to just pause for a minute, because we don't do this often enough. Look up. Look at this room that we conduct our business in. Just take a moment to take it in. Take a moment to think about the diversity of thought and people that you serve with here in this chamber. Think about the amazing issues that you get to work on here in this chamber. And think about the amazing people who put enough faith in you to cast their vote for you to come here and do that work on their behalf. And each one of us comes here and takes that job incredibly seriously. And in that process, we serve on committees. We get to kind of specialize in issues and dig in in those committees. I think right now it's, it's changed over time, and in some bienniums it's more, in some it's fewer. Right now, I think members serve on generally about three or four committees. And in that committee work, they get to roll up their sleeves, and each bill that uh, has to do with that jurisdiction gets referred to that committee. And they get to ask questions and dig into it, and, and, and most importantly, probably, take testimony from people impacted by the decisions that we make. They get to take testimony from experts who will carry out a lot of these things. We get to take testimony from commissioners or people from the administration. But the most important people that we get to hear from are the Minnesotans that are impacted by the decisions we make. And the reason that I've asked you to think about that first day when you got sworn in and when you walked up those steps and looked up at this amazing building that they built for us more than 100 years ago And when you, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, am I, am I uh, debating too loudly here? Members, please keep your conversations to the alcove. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, you know, it, it, it's funny that I'm literally talking about how important our jobs are. And the importance of walking up those steps on the first day and the feeling that you had in your heart about how important the work was that you were going to do here. And when you walked into this chamber for the first time and you looked up and you said, my goodness, how did I get the incredible privilege of doing this job in this place at this time? And I know that everybody takes that job seriously. Sometimes I sit at my desk, much to the chagrin of my staff probably, and the phone will ring and I see that it's a number from my district and I answer the phone. And I don't say who I am, I just say hello. And they say, well, I'm, I'm calling to, to tell Representative Doubt that I either support or don't support this issue. And I say, well, this is he. No, you're kidding. You don't answer your own phone there, do you? And I say, sure. Not all the time, but I, <laughs> if I'm sitting there and it rings and I see that it's a number from my district, I answer it. Because I care about what people in my district think. I take my job seriously as a state representative. And their opinion matters the most to me. And I have heard some heart-wrenching stories about things that have impacted their lives. Lost loved ones. Accidents that have put children into the hospital for months because a, an intersection is dangerous. Um, families torn apart by a death because of addiction who are advocating for some change of public policy. 
And those are the people that keep me going every day. Because I know that the work that we do here is incredibly important. And in my time here, I have seen and I have probably participated in on occasion, skirting the process a little bit to make things go a little quicker, maybe sending a vehicle bill through committee. I'll explain to folks at home what that means. You know, sometimes uh, you'll hear a committee chair and committee bring up a bill that maybe just changes one line, maybe changes the name of something. Not a real impactful thing. And you look at that bill and you say, is this really important? And then you realize that's what we call a vehicle bill. And a lot of times the chair will say that in committee, this is just a vehicle bill. And what it means is that vehicle bill will work its way through the process to a later committee where it will just sit and wait in case it's needed, and then later we'll amend something onto it. And then it'll continue to move through the process and ultimately it'll come here to the House floor. I will tell you in my 11 years, I have never seen an affront to our process like the one in front of me right now. This, my friends, is the worst example of a vehicle bill that I've ever seen. Today in the House of Representatives, Democrats will pass a bill that is exactly five lines. And this bill has an appropriation for $1 million in it. This is the bill, and I don't know if you can see it on TV at home. But there's the language of the bill right there. This is the bill that we're passing. This, my friends, is the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. This is it. Had Representative Schumacher, by the way, this is his amendment that he just offered. This bill right here is his amendment. Had this amendment gone on to the bill, or excuse me, had he not withdrawn it, let me say it that way, a Democrat on the other side of the aisle would have stood up and said, I move that this amendment is out of order because it violates rule 3.21 or 4.05 or pick your number. And the Democrats would have voted in solidarity to back up the speaker who would have ruled that this is out of order in a debate on this bill. But there's a very good chance that when we see this bill come back from the Senate, it will look like this. And I assure you that if this amendment was out of order now, when there's an attempt made in this chamber to adopt the Senate amendment of this, it will most surely and should not be accepted in this chamber. And for those of you who serve in this chamber, you know exactly why Democrats are doing this. But for those of you at home, I'll explain to you what can't happen because this bill is in front of us. Not only did this bill not go to committee, where the members of this chamber who have specialized in these issues and know the most about them did not get to vet this bill, with their questions and with amendments and get to go through it and fix little uh, things that were probably unintentional. But today on the House floor, we don't even get to debate the real Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. We don't get to offer amendments to this to show Minnesotans that we have better ideas and to get recorded votes so Minnesotans can see where members of this chamber stand on these issues. What we get to vote on is this, five lines and a $1 million appropriation, probably a worthy program, tribal public health grants. I'd be interested to know if this is actually in this bill. I have no idea because we didn't get to hear this one in committee. 
But I will tell you that not only is this an affront to our rules, this is an abomination of the process here in the House of Representatives. This is a slap in the face to the people who we represent. And members, this is a slap in the face to you, all of you, regardless of which party you serve from. And remember that when you do this sort of thing, you later don't get to claim that you want to see bills in committee and that you want to offer amendments on them and you want to have an opportunity to read them and debate them. So what happens is a slow slide over time to a place that's probably worse than this. I didn't think we'd ever get to this point in the House of Representatives. But because today this is okay, I shudder to imagine what you will think is okay the next time. So when you go home and have to explain some of the terrible policy that's in this bill, which likely will be back before this body today once the Senate inserts this into this, you can explain to people that you didn't have any input in it because you chose not to, because you voted not to, because your party bosses told you this was for the best. So when health insurance rates go up for people that are impacted by that, by 30 percent, you can say, yep, I voted to do that. I voted to back my party bosses who told me it was okay if your insurance rates went up by 30 percent. They didn't want me to have an opinion. They didn't want me to have a vote. And they didn't want me to read this bill. They wanted me to, to read and debate this one. This isn't a partisan issue. And since I've been in this, uh, this body, I've been in the majority twice and I've been in the minority twice. And I'm going to be in the majority again after the next election. And I assure you, I will not do this stuff to you. But what you need to ask yourselves is, do you really think it's okay to do this to the people in my district? and to the people in your district. The rules seem like really inconvenient little things, right? Designed to make us jump through hoops. They're there for a reason. They're there because they allow you to do your job. And when you skirt them, not only do you not allow me to do my job, but you don't allow yourselves to do your own job. So two people have negotiated the HHS bill, which isn't before this body. And they've made all of the decisions in this bill. And today, we get to debate and vote on this. Four lines that will become 40% of the state's budget. 40% of the state's budget. And a Democrat stood on the House floor here today and said, we need to lower the cost of health care in this state. But we can't debate it on the House floor because this bill increases the cost of health care in Minnesota. And it increases the cost of health coverage in Minnesota. And it hurts Minnesota families. But because we want to abuse the rules of this body, we don't get to talk about it. We have to talk about this. There's never been a stronger reason to send a bill back to committee. And I got to tell you, I'm ashamed that you all call yourselves leaders in the House of Representatives, because today you are not leading. So members, Please vote green to send this bill back to committee. And let's try to actually do our jobs here.
because today you have failed Minnesotans miserably, and Minnesotans will be hurt by your actions. And there is no other conclusion to come to other than you're doing this on purpose because you want to hide all of that from the people you represent. There's no other conclusion that I can come to. Because if this really is the agreement, you could have amended it on the bill right here, right now. We could have debated it, and we could have offered amendments together to make it better. But instead, you chose to hide it from Minnesotans. And they will remember that, and I will remember that. So members, please vote green to send this bill back to committee. Discussion. Madam Speaker. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, for a moment there, I thought that Kurt Doubt, that Representative Doubt was giving his retirement speech with all of the language about looking at the ceiling and all of that. But uh, members, I, am, I would ask you to vote no on the motion. We need to get this done. We are at June 26th and we need to pass a budget to keep the state open. So please vote no on the motion. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? <clears throat> Bonner. Bonner, no. Bonner, no. Baker. Baker, aye. Baker, aye. Bliss. Bliss, aye. Bliss, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Lucero. Lucero, yes. Lucero, aye. Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Munson. Munson, aye. Munson, aye. Murphy. Murphy, no. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? The clerk will close the roll. There being 58 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment, the motion does not prevail. Further discussion on third reading. <laughs> the member from right, Representative Lucero. Madam Speaker, if you just called Lucero's name, it must have been an accident. Sorry. Further discussion? If not, the clerk will take the roll on third reading.
Members, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? Honor. I. Bonner, I. Baker. Baker, no. Baker, no. Bliss. Bliss, no. Bliss, no. Bo. Bo, no. Bo, no. Franzen. Franzen, <clears throat> Hamilton, Hamilton, no, Hamilton, no, Houseman, Houseman, I, Houseman, I, Hollins, Hollins, I, Hollins, I, Lucero, Lucero, yes, I'm sorry, no. Lucero, no. Absolutely not. Lucero, no. Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Munson. Munson, no. Munson, no. Sandstead. Sandstead, yes. Sandstead, I. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? The clerk will close the roll. There being 68 ayes and 57 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.